it that the activity of these neurons generates your mind. And the problem uh, is that if you try to understand the brain one neuron at a time, it's a little bit like trying to watch a movie in a TV if you look at a single pixel. So it doesn't matter for how long you look at one pixel in a movie, even if you have an infinite amount of time, you will never understand what plays in the TV because the images on a TV screen are uh, a, an emergent property that arises from the interaction between pixels. So the pixels in the screen interact in space, in time, and in color. And it's this correlation between pixels that build an image. And it's only when you see the image you realize what is the purpose of the picture and what is the purpose of the movie and the story that the movie is telling you. So this is a classical example of an emergent property uh, which, can, by definition, cannot be understood if you look at the individual units. Emergent property is what gets lost if you break the system into individual units. So imagine that the brain is a little bit like, TV, like a TV screen, except uh, in your case, you have about 80 billion pixels. Okay? This is now an example of the uh, primary visual cortex of mice, which is one of the pieces of the brain that we study. Every white dot is a neuron. And just to give you a feeling, uh, the primary visual cortex of a mouse has 180,000 neurons. So uh, imagine trying to understand that if you record with uh, one electrode from one neuron and you try to correlate that with uh, what the mouse is looking at or with the behavior of the animal. So uh, you will never get it uh, because there are going to be patterns of firings of neurons just like in that TV screen. And it's only when you see the patterns that will you be able to actually capture the essence of the function. So how can you see the patterns? How can we look at the activity of the whole TV screen of our brains? Um, it, we're not going to be able to do that by putting more electrodes. We're going to turn the brain into Swiss uh, cheese. Okay? Uh, so we need something different. We need new technology, technology that it doesn't exist today. So how can you do that? We were inspired by the success of the Human Genome Project, which uh, was a 15-year project that cost $2 billion, in which uh, teams of scientists, uh, interdisciplinary scientists, mixing uh, biologists with physicists, geneticists, medical doctors, chemists, engineers, uh, computational people, build the tools to sequence entire genomes. And they actually succeeded. And the Human Genome Project has changed biology forever and has enabled uh, uh, humanity to get into the field of personalized medicine. And it's also had tremendous uh, economical implications. It is estimated that every dollar spent in the Human Genome Project uh, led to uh, in the economy of uh, to $124 15 years later. So uh, what we propose is something similar for neuroscience a large-scale project that we call the Brain Activity Map. And we here refer to a small group of scientists uh, that were all uh, fascinated by the possibility that the brain uh, has emergent properties that we cannot capture with individual electrodes. Uh, and the Brain Activity Map was proposed to the White House, to President Obama, and he actually endorsed it. Uh, he changed the name, uh, because being the President of the United States, you can change the name of things. So he called it the Brain Initiative, also known as Obama's Brain Initiative. And uh, it's his uh, baby, his creation. We just took a uh, uh, proud part in inspiring this project. And the goal was something similar to the Human Genome Project, but focused on neuroscience. Technology development for three goals. The first goal is to record the activity of every neuron in a brain starting uh, like the Human Genome Project with a small animal like a worm, and then graduating as the tools get better to uh, bigger animals like uh, fruit flies, fish, mouse, and then eventually landing on the human brain, uh, maybe not uh, measuring the activity of every neuron in the human brain, but maybe measuring the activity of every neuron in a piece of a human brain of a patient, let's say a schizophrenic patient, for example, like my cousin. So the second goal is to develop methods to interfere with this activity, to change the pattern of firing. 
because it's not going to help patients if we can see their uh, neural circuits and record the activity of every neuron and understand what's going on if we cannot go in and fix their problem. We need to be interventionists. Just like every doctor before us, we have to go in and be able to change the system to cure the disease. And for these therapies, we need methods to change the activity, change those pixels in that TV screen so that we can project in that screen what pattern we want. The third types of methods, and these are all interdisciplinary methods uh, that are not going to be built by biologists or medical doctors. We need physicists, chemists, engineers, mathematicians, just like it happened with the Human Genome Project. The third type of uh, goal is uh, a computational mathematical goal. Can we look at the pattern of activity of a neural circuit, imagine every spike from every neuron, and can we read this out and decipher like in a cryptography exercise, what is being coded? What is the meaning of that activity? The BRAIN Initiative started uh, four years ago. Uh, it is uh, funded by uh, Congress, uh, the US. Uh, the estimated budget is $6 billion. It's going to last 12 years. Uh, and there's funding uh, that has bipartisan support, both Republican and Democratic congressmen and senators have been pushing the BRAIN initiative regardless of the change in the president. So that must be one of the few cases where there's unity in American politics. And uh, the idea is that the BRAIN initiative will carry its course. This money is being uh, given to the uh, federal funding agencies like uh, NIH, NSF, DARPA, IARPA, and they distribute that funding to approximately 500 laboratories today, all around the U.S. and around the world. This, I should mention, is an initiative which is not limited to the U.S. Any researcher from anywhere in the world can apply for this funding. It's open to the whole world. It's one uh, uh, exception uh, in the rule that the taxpayer money stays in the same country. In this case, it's U.S. taxpayer money which gets sent to whoever in the world uh, is best at this. Huh? The Bear Initiative has also uh, inspired other initiatives in other countries. So um, there's now a global brain initiative, uh, which represents the union of brain initiatives in China, in Japan, in North Korea, Israel, Australia, Canada, and also in the European Union that had another brain project uh, that started uh, independently of the brain initiative. Uh, since December uh, this last year, uh, we uh, uh, when we met in Australia, we signed a declaration of the foundation of the International Brain Initiative. So now uh, the Brain Initiative is now taking over a truly global, global status. Uh, funding of all the countries together uh, is uh, huge. Uh, the Chinese Brain Initiative is supposed to be three times bigger than the U.S. Brain Initiative, just to give you some numbers. So we're truly at a historical moment in neuroscience. This had never happened before. The world has turned a corner and decided that we're going to figure out how the brain works by developing these methods to understand neural circuits. Uh, here is a tentative roadmap of the Brain Initiative. Uh, the idea is that in five years we'll be able to record the activity completely of uh, animals that have brains of about 50,000 neurons, in 10 years of 1 million neurons, and in 15 years, entire brains of behaving animals. And uh, I'm just going to show you some examples uh, of how uh, this is being done today. Uh, now, uh, we're, again, I told you this is at the beginning of the Brain Initiative, so, uh, and I don't have a crystal ball. I cannot tell you what's going to happen. Uh, and, but I can tell you what we're doing in our lab today so that you get a feeling for the kinds of methods and the kinds of data that we're starting to gather. So I'm just one of these 500 labs, and in our lab, we're focusing on optics. We think that the technical solution to this problem of reading activity from brains and interfering or modulating with the activity of brains uh, can be approached as a, using optical methods, using lasers and, and indicators to read and write activity into neural circuits. And this starts uh, when I was a graduate student working with Larry Katz at Rockefeller University in New York, where we developed a method to use fluorescent calcium indicators 
to stain uh, brains, to stain neurons in the brain, and then use microscopy to monitor the changes in fluorescence as a function of time. And we got lucky because every time a neuron fires, and this is illustrated here in this panel where you see electrical recordings, so this is voltage as a function of time of one neuron, and these are the famous action potentials. So these action potentials is when the neurons turn on or off. You see how they're little digital signals. And if you look below, if you can see in the screen, it's a little hard to see. And this is the measurement, optical measurements of the fluorescence of this neuron. And every time there's an action potential, there's a little increase in the fluorescence. And this is because we're measuring concentration of calcium inside the neuron with a fluorescent indicator. And uh, we got doubly lucky because every time a neuron fires, every time it's activated, there are calcium channels that open and let in calcium into the cell. Which means that if you monitor calcium optically, you have an indirect readout of the activity of the neuron. And we can do this simultaneously for many neurons at the same time. So here you have 500 neurons in the brain of a mouse uh, that are labeled with this calcium indicator. So every gray dot is one neuron. And this is 10 minutes in the life of this piece of brain. And whenever the neuron is active, you see a little red dot. And this is something that we've uh, stamped whenever we see one of these calcium transients in the neuron. So it's not uh, 180,000 neurons uh, th that I told you of the visual cortex of the mouse. It's only 500. So it's only a little piece of that TV screen. But the good news, in, in that little corner of that TV screen, we can see every neuron. For the first time, we can see the complete activity of a small neural circuit using calcium indicators. So using these methods, uh, we're investigating the activity of brain circuits in different species in the tree of life. So this is a very simple representation of the tree of life. Uh, and just about 700 million years ago, after periphera, which are the sponges, which do not have neurons, uh, nature evolves the cnidaria. So this is the first branch of the tree of life uh, that has neurons. So this is the beginning of the first nervous systems in evolution. Again, we're talking uh, 700 million years ago. The concentration of oxygen in the planet is very different from today. And these cnidarians are uh, uh, jellyfish, uh, corals, sea anemone, and hydrozoans, polyps like this one. This is called hydra. Uh, and then a little bit later, the next branch of the tree of life comes about. And these are the bilaterians. Uh, bilaterians are animals that have bilateral symmetry like ourselves. We are typical bilaterians, if you think about it. And this includes uh, many of the other animals that people use in the laboratory, like worms, flies, mice, etc. They all have bilateral symmetry. They're much more advanced than the cnidarians. Bilaterians have heads, and they also have uh, most of the neurons in the, in the, in the front part of the, of the body, in the head. And that's actually which evolves uh, into the human brain. So uh, I'm going to show you data with one of these cnidarians called uh, Hydra. Hydra is a transparent cnidarian. It's about one centimeter tall. Uh, it lives in fresh water, uh, in ponds and rivers. I'm sure there are Hydra here outside in the fountains. And these cnidarians uh, have a very simple nervous system, about 600 neurons spread out through the body of the animal. They have a, a, a simple body with a mouth, a tentacles. They use the tentacles to hunt uh, prey, like little shrimp, and they eat them. And uh, these uh, cnidarians uh, can be uh, made transgenic. Um, so we made transgenic hydra expressing these calcium indicators into every neuron of the animal. And here you have a movie in which every bright dot is a neuron, and these are expressing calcium indicators. And when the neurons are flashing, that's when the neurons are active. So this is the first case in which we can see the complete TV screen of an, the brain of an animal. This is admittedly a very simple animal. These are the simplest animals that have brains, the cnidarians. But in this cnidarian, we can see every neuron while the animal is behaving. So this is giving us the hope that we can analyze data like this one and extract the activity of every neuron 
while the animal is moving, while the animal is eating, while the animal is reproducing, and decipher the neural code, be able to read out what the animal is doing from the activity of the neurons, more importantly, predict what the animal wants to do or what the animal has done. We want to really understand this nervous system completely. So you could say, well, who cares about cnidarians? How about uh, uh, humans? How about mammals? So humans are mammals, and we study the brains of mice, uh, the, in particular the cerebral cortex of mice, as I told you, the primary visual cortex, because if we can decipher how a little piece of the cortex of the mouse works, the cortex is the largest uh, a part of the brain in mammals, and it actually dominates completely our brains, the cerebral cortex. So we have the hope that understanding how one piece of cortex works in one animal could unlock the secrets to understand how the human cerebral cortex works. So let me show you data from uh, awake behaving mice. And this is again calcium imaging data. Now you're pretty familiar with movies like this one. So you have uh, fluorescent intensity movies made of, uh, with a special microscope that use uh, ultra-fast lasers that are infrared that can penetrate into the brain even through the skull of these animals. And the animal is awake behaving, it's running on a treadmill and it's looking at a TV screen where we're projecting different patterns of light. Simultaneously with this, we're measuring the activity of every neuron in a little corner of its primary visual cortex and this is actually the analyzed version of this movie. And again, the neurons that are turning red are the ones that are active. And if you look at these patterns, you can see how there are synchronized patterns of neurons, groups of neurons that are firing together uh, while the animal is behaving. In fact, I guarantee that in your brains right now, there's nothing more than this, except instead of uh, looking at a few hundred neurons, you have 80 billion neurons turning on and off in patterns flashing in patterns uh, like this. So this is the challenge of neuroscience. Can we take this data, can we decipher, can we read this pattern uh, and understand what it means? It's a cryptography uh, job. So how about humans? Let me show you an example of what we're doing with humans today. And this is the work of our colleagues at Brown University. Uh, this, uh, this woman is a uh, tetraplegic. She's paralyzed from the neck down. She cannot move her arms or her legs, and she's implanted with a few electrodes in the primary frontal, sorry, in the primary motor cortex, and these electrodes are connected to a computer that is moving a robotic arm. So this is called a brain-computer interface, and she can use the computer to move the arm by thinking. So with time, these brain-computer interfaces enable patients like her to use their thoughts to, through a relatively uh, a long process, train this arm. And this is the case where she's been able to take a sip of water by her own volition for the first time in 20 years. This is what we can do today with uh, recording the activity of very few neurons in the cortex of this uh, patient. Now, if you look at the progress of technology, uh, back where we had these types of phones, we had very simple uh, electrical recording methods from, uh, from the brain. When we had these flip phones, we had electrodes. This woman was implanted with electrodes that look like this. So each electrode records from one neuron, and at most you have three or four electrodes in there. So this is the equivalent of a flip, flip phone. But that was good in the 90s. Now we're in 2018. We have... Uh, iPhones have things that are much more sophisticated. So what is the technology today to be able to record the activity of the brain of humans? And let me tell you about one project that is ongoing. So this is a project funded uh, by uh, DARPA, which is the research branch of the US military. And the goal here is to help paralyze uh, soldiers, just like uh, this woman that have suffered uh, head wounds in, uh, in battle, and they're essentially uh, in hospitals paralyzed without being able to do anything. So this is a chip that has one million electrodes. Uh, this is built out of semiconductor material, CMOS, and it's very thin, so it's flexible. 
So you can actually, uh, the plan is to implant the chip into the brains of paralyzed people like this woman and connect it wirelessly to a brain-computer interface that could be then trained to assist uh, robotic arms or robotic limbs so that m people like her could have maybe a normal life, could even drive a car. Look at what she can do with four uh, neurons. Imagine what uh, she could do if we could uh, record the activity of a million neurons with this chip. This is not science fiction. This project is ongoing and is supposed to be approved by the FDA for use in patients in less than three years. This chip and the same electrodes that I showed you earlier in the woman can be used to read the activity of neurons but also to stimulate the activity of neurons. Um, so this brings the possibility that if we're successful as scientists, and we will be, at some point we're going to decipher the neural code and understand the message that is written in the activity of neurons in brains of animals and in brains of people. So these uh, also these types of methods, which are the same methods that are needed to help patients, to desperately help patients, we have the responsibility to act quickly to help these millions of people in the world that suffer from mental and neurological diseases, including your uh, family uh, uh, or your friends. The same technologies can be also used on normal people to either decipher their patterns of brain activity or to interfere with their uh, patterns of brain activity. And I'm telling you that there's nothing more inside your head than these neurons firing. So you can change the firing of your, the neurons, you can change the mental processes of people and the behavior of animals. In fact, we're already doing this with animals, with mice. Uh, we're already changing the behaviors that they have by stimulating precisely groups of neurons. So this raises all kinds of ethical problems. Uh, uh, this, I showed you a picture here of the building where I work at Columbia, and next to it is the physics building. It's called Pupin Hall, and this building is a national monument because in the 1930s, they built the first atomic reactor in the world in the basement of this building, and the physicists who built this reactor were the same ones who formed the Manhattan Project that built the first atomic bomb. And it was called Manhattan because it was actually first conceived in Manhattan in New York. Eventually, they took it to uh, the desert in Los Alamos, in New Mexico, not because they were worried about radiation safety, but because they couldn't secure New York from German spies. Okay? Anyway, it was the same physicists who built the atomic bomb, the first ones to alert people that this technology of nuclear technology was so potent that could wipe out humanity. And it was through their efforts uh, and then later by President Eisenhower that the UN created the Atomic Energy Commission in the 1950s that has regulated and controlled the development and use of atomic energy in the world. Fingers crossed there hasn't been a single uh, incident since the uh, use in Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the war. So this is an example of scientists bringing to society the responsibility to control a technology that they've developed that can be used for good or for bad. Technologies are neutral. They don't have any ethical uh, conscience, but it's up to the humans uh, that uh, use this technology to use it in one way or the other. And uh, I also put down below, this is a picture of the uh, Museum of Historical Memory in Santiago, Chile. And as you walk into the museum, you have a wall where you have written in stone the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, one by one. So as you walk into this historical memory museum where they tell the story, a uh, terrible story of the disappeared and all the thousands of people that lost their lives for political reasons, and this is something that could resonate uh, in this country very well, uh, is uh, you come to realize that there's some basic core of values that makes us human. So we think that these technologies, so near technology, particularly when combined with artificial intelligence, uh, are going to enable uh, people to manipulate uh, the mental activity of other people. And because of that, we have to put in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 
some basic uh, new rights that would protect uh, citizens from the abuse of these technologies. So uh, these uh, new rights is something that we call the neuro rights and we here represent a group of 25 experts that come from different countries that come from medicine, neuroscience, um, uh, um, bioethics, uh, psychology, uh, clinic, and uh, the law. So we've, um, after a few meetings, we propose uh, to have some new rights added to this Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And these are rights that would protect uh, the human, uh, the mental privacy of humans so that your neural data cannot be uh, extracted or sold without your consent. This is your most private uh, uh, data you ever have, which is your, your own thoughts or even more private, the things that uh, your brain is doing that you're not even consciously aware of, your subconsciousness. This is all going to be open to uh, deciphering with this technology. So this has to be sacred. This has to be your right. Uh, another right is the right to our own identity. Through these brain-computer interfaces, you can have people connected uh, to a supercomputer, to artificial intelligence algorithms, and they can be used uh, to dilute the sense of identity of individuals and also to take over the free will of individuals. If your decision is made based on an algorithm which is not in your head but in some supercomputer somewhere, uh, you've lost the sense of agency. So we think that the agency and this identity should be a fundamental human rights and it should be uh, guaranteed uh, by the UN and by all the governments, just like the human rights are. And let me tell you that these are things that humans never had to worry about before. When people uh, generated the Declaration of Human Rights, no one even thought that you could actually lose your identity or your agency or that people could read uh, your thoughts. These are not even in the picture. So now we can, uh, we can see how we can do that. Uh, we ha we're not doing it that yet, but we have to be proactive. We have to make sure that these things are in place. And then the final two rights. One has to do with this possibility, which is very uh, real, of augmenting our mental uh, abilities. If we connect ourselves to a supercomputer, we're going to be able to have access to much more information than a normal person. And these algorithms can enable us to uh, uh, succeed in uh, solving uh, problems uh, that you cannot solve uh, uh, by yourself. So this is going to make humans who have this technology be augmented and form like a superhuman uh, group of people that will be able to will be much more advanced than the rest of the society. And this uh, technology is not going to be cheap. So you can imagine only uh, people who can afford it, rich people in particular countries who have access to that technology, and the rest of humanity could actually be left behind. We want to ensure that this does not happen and making also as a human right the equal access to this technology so that this technology can be used in a way in which it does not increase the divisions in our society or in our, in our cultures. The final right is the right uh, not to be discriminated uh, when applied with algorithms of artificial in intelligence. These algorithms unfortunately often have bias which are hidden even to the engineers that build the algorithms and they tend to discriminate, guess what, against minorities, either women, uh, religious minorities or, or racial minorities. So this is also a basic human rights. These algorithms should be guaranteed not to discriminate against any group of humans. They're, they're there to help people. So you would think, well, this is uh, great, but uh, how the hell are you going to do that? How can you change the, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Well, we cannot change it by ourselves, but we can talk about it and we can talk to the society at large. And uh, more specifically, we also uh, propose to follow a model that has worked in history. Uh, and this is the medical model, and I will finish with this. If you look back at the history of medicine, medicine is also a technology that can be used for good or for bad. It's neutral. There's no reason that uh, the knowledge and methods that doctors uh, have developed over uh, thousands of years cannot be used to hurt people, but they're not. Why not? Because every doctor in every culture 
going back now to the ancient Greeks, to Hippocrates, swear the Hippocratic Oath to use their knowledge and their technology to help uh, the patient, to help people. And this is true in every society throughout history, with almost no exception. Even in the most brutal dictatorships in history, you go to the doctor and the doctor helps you. Even in North Korea, you go to the doctor and you have someone there who's going to help you. He's not going to use these methods to hurt you. So this is something that every uh, society has assumed as a very natural way. Uh, so what we're proposing is to follow that medical model and to make not only the uh, people that develop these methods in neuroscience, but also the people that develop these methods in artificial intelligence in the computer industry take a Hippocratic oath, a technocratic oath, if you may, so that as you're trained, you actually guaranteed to use this knowledge and these methods to help people. And with this, I just wanted to finish uh, on a positive note. So I'm telling you these methods are very important. They're going to have profound uh, consequences for uh, humanity. They can change the definition of uh, who we are, or what we consider humans. Uh, and because of that, uh, we have to be very alert and we have to make sure that they do that in a way in which uh, society is not uh, suffering, which it leads to progress. Uh, so I think we're really at the beginning of what could be a new new uh, renaissance, and uh, because uh, this is these methods could enable humans to understand our minds, so that means that we'll understand ourselves for the first time. Uh, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm going to be a moderator of next session, but before this, if you have questions, please. So the, you demonstrated the embedded uh, flexible uh, sensor which can be put inside. Uh, how do you, so, uh, what is the power source for that and how much it can work? Yeah, how do so you this, this prototype that I showed you is getting built actually by a consortium of about uh, 40 labs around the world, and it's going to have a power source that's going to be uh, wireless, and the power source is going to be actually, uh, you can wear it in your pocket, it's going to be uh, remote, and uh, it, will, it will have an antenna uh, inside in the chip, and another antenna right outside, and you can wear it on the, on, the, on the outside of the skull. This technology is invasive, you need surgery, uh, but uh, let me tell you that there's, first of all, all these patients that are paralyzed, they already have electrodes in their brain, so that's not a problem for them. But there are technologies like this that are getting planned in the Brain Initiative for non-invasive recording and actuation of, uh, of human brain. So it's not crazy to think that you could have technologies like this in the future, talking 10 years from now, which will be non-invasive. In that case, uh, you could just wear it. You will not need any surgery. I think also if this, this enables people to augment their mental abilities and if this leads to a huge economic outcome for the person, I can imagine that people will want to, uh, to have neurosurgery then and get implanted. Uh, yes. Thanks very much. Uh, actually, I have a couple dozen questions, but two probably most. One at a time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you said that the chip contains about one million of electrodes yes. that can target specifically. So how precisely they target neuron? And, yes. and is there any depth consideration yes. for this? So this is exactly the what, second, let me just answer this question first. This is exactly what we're working on. With one million electrodes, first of all, how many neurons can you record from? Because if you have one million electrodes, that doesn't mean you can record from a million neurons. And how deep can you record it? So we're actually helping uh, this project doing experiments in mice in which we have our optical methods at the same time as these electrical methods. And we can actually calibrate uh, what is the uh, electrical ability to record. I should mention that this chip can also stimulate. Uh, so uh, it, can, it can only stimulate 100,000 uh, through 100,000 of these electrodes. So it's not through a million, but still 100,000 is a lot of stimulating electrodes. So we're, uh, we're trying to calibrate also the stimulation part. And the um, second question related to brain-computer brain interface. So basically, you can train, it's, when you record the signal, you can then train computer to do whatever task you want. So if you just want a task to bring a bottle to the mouse, it, you will train it and 
it will do it like that. If you train something else, it will do something else. But how this training really, you use training data like you really train uh, in black box way. Yeah. So how this interface somehow resembles the, in the human physiology of yeah. uh, transmitting yes. the signals and getting... Yes, this is, this is an excellent question. At this point, you're completely right. These brain computer, computer interfaces, they work as a black box. They have a neural network and it may have nothing to do with the way the brain does it. But these technologies will enable people like myself to decipher how the brain does it. So people like me will write a paper in the future and say, you know what, this is how the brain does this solution. And then you can build an algorithm with a computer to match the brain. So uh, if you look at the success of the computer technology and neural networks today, all of them, every one of them, is, uh, of, I'm talking about the deep neural networks, it's inspired by how engineers think the human brain works, except they're using a very old-fashioned model of how the brain works. So imagine what could happen when we really understand how the brain does it. Not just our brain, the brain of other animals, even some simple animals like Hydra. Then it's very predictable that these algorithms that are at the heart of this uh, computer technology will uh, become a revolution. You'll use a completely new algorithm which will be much more powerful. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, my first question was about, uh, you said that in five years you're going to study 50,000 50, and then in the next, in next five you're going to reach million. Yep. How is gonna, this leap going to happen? Yes, yeah, so it turns out uh, it depends how quickly the measurement is taken. So uh, there are people that are already recording from 180,000 neurons. Uh, so this is the entire uh, brain of a larva of a fish using this calcium imaging method that I showed you but they're taking data just about uh, one per second. So it's a very slow readout. So uh, we're not there yet. These numbers are meant to be with one kilohertz uh, precision, uh, 1,000 times per second. So um, again, so we're not, we haven't yet achieved this milestone of 50,000 neurons at one kilohertz. We've done 180,000 neurons at one hertz. And my second comment was just exactly as Dr. Rakin said. Uh, it seems like in normal AI algorithm, you don't know what's happening inside this neural network. You just well, have an, uh, an answer, and then if that's the same way how it's going to interpret, you don't know actually what's it's interpreting. It, de it depends. Uh, people like me are the ones who are finding out how it works. I look at people in the uh, tech industry, and they, they are the black box people, but we're actually the people that open the black box and go into the brain. So we still don't know how it works, uh, but that's why we're starting with uh, smaller animals, and we hope to figure that out first in smaller animals, just like the genetic code was first figured out in bacteriophages. And then once we know how little animals work, then we can see if the rules are the same in bigger, bigger animals. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, it's really fascinating story. Thank you. Uh, so first, uh, do you think there will be a way to go to about neurodegeneration? And that's especially an important question for yes. the emergence of Alzheimer's disease. And yeah, let me answer that question. So we're actually working in my own lab, but we have methods to optically turn neurons on. And these groups of neurons that you saw flashing together, we call them ensembles. You can think it's just a group of neurons flying together. Anyway, there's a very good uh, possibility that these groups of neurons is what the brain is using to implement a memory. Okay. So we're working in the lab with mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. And the idea is to use our optical methods to enhance the activity of these groups of neurons and to see if that changes the behavior of the animal, if they can actually remember better. So if that's the case, then maybe you can imagine of, of therapies, which would be smart therapies that would go into the brain of an Alzheimer patient. I'm picking Alzheimer's as an example, but you can imagine with any other of these brain diseases, and then find out uh, which are the neurons involved in particular things, and then go in and stimulate them to make them more uh, robust. Fascinating. And the second question is related to ethics. ethics so yeah. as, a as a software developer, uh, you know, I know that every software has a back door. Yeah. So you can imagine implanting ideas, yes. uh, election strategies yes. in uh, 
people exactly. have that access. Yes. So how do you think you can prevent that? Yes. So actually, I, f I didn't mention that part of our group uh, are people that come from the tech industry, including the head of AI at Google. He's also Blas Aguera. He's also part of our group. And uh, they're very worried about this because they know how you know that you can actually manipulate these uh, algorithms uh, sneakily. So, uh, so it has to, I think we need a change of culture. The problem is actually bigger uh, than, uh, than it seems. Uh, and it has to be also dealt with, not at the local level, it has to be a global solution. So I welcome your ideas. This is the best we could come up with, but we're just a group of 25 people. Uh, and uh, we think that not only we need to get uh, the UN involved, but also change the culture of the software companies and the tech industry so that every employee from the CEO to the last hire are swearing some sort of Hippocratic oath uh, to act in a particular way and they have legal consequences if they don't. They're legally liable if uh, something like that happens. Then uh, just like in the medical industry, if you run a pharma company and you develop a drug and that drug ends up killing people instead of saving people, you go to jail. You have a legal responsibility. So the same thing should apply to the computer industry. Let's encourage young scientists, yes. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. I have a short question. You said that you plan to import chips into the brains of paralyzed people so they can control robots. Does it mean that in future you will propose uh, the trans to transplant a human brain, a human head, onto the robotic body? Yeah, so I think that I can I believe you can control a robot by thinking, and you've seen an example of a primitive brain-computer interfaces, no problem. But I disagree with the word transplant. Uh, I'm not completely sure that you can actually take the, the, our mental life, which is generated by our brain, even if you know the activity of every neuron, and put it on a computer or, 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 or build a machine, uh, an avatar. Uh, and I'm not sure you can do that. And it depends how the brain works. And I, my responsibility is to tell you that we don't know how the brain works. So it could be yes or no. Okay. If the brain works like a digital computer, in other words, if the uh, algorithms of the brain uh, works, follow the same rules that digital computers follow, then yes, then it should be able to get all the activity of the brain figure out the algorithms and build another brain in silicon that will replicate the first brain. But if the brain is not a digital computer, then maybe not. Let me give you an example. If the brain activity depends on the hardware on which it runs, okay, and if it's an organic uh, computer, an organic machine, then you cannot replicate it in silicon. You have to replicate it in the same organic matter with the same amino acids, the same lipids, the same carbohydrates. So that means that if you want to copy the brain, you cannot copy it in a computer. You have to clone the animal. You have to make another animal. In fact, that happens all the time when you have uh, identical twins. But these identical twins, they have different brains and the different people because that brain itself has its own internal activity that changes even if you have exact DNA. No? So I think my intuition is that we're dealing with a biological organic computer and that you won't be able to just cut and paste. Uh, it will remain with the hardware that it's built with. One more question. Uh, I wonder if we can use BCI for subconscious processes? Yes. Yes, so the question is if you can do PC BCI for subconscious processes. Um, I'm pretty sure you will be able to. Uh, you know, a lo most of what we do in life is actually subconscious. You're not even aware that you do it. And sometimes, even when you make a decision, there are signals in your brain before you make a decision that correlate with the decision that you're making. So uh, that's why I brought up the possibility that if we can decipher the neural code and see everything that's in there, we're going to see things that you yourself are not aware of. And that's the ultimate mental privacy. I mean, if you're worried about privacy of your cell phone, for this is nothing compared to <laughs> the ability to actually read everything you are and the thing that you don't even know you are. No? So that's why we think this is sacred. This should be in the this should be the first human right. Okay, this is 
We are people, we are one, we have uh, our mental privacy, and that should be uh, sacred ground. Uh, our proposal is that mental data should not be, um, be able to be commerced with. It should be treated legally like an organ donation. You know, you can donate an organ to save a person, but you cannot sell organs. And uh, this is like an organ, except it's a mental organ. It's not a physical substrate. It's actually a mental substrate, but it should have the same protection. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Thank you. I have a question about optimization. Do you think about optimizing your protocols? For example, maybe to trigger the activity of brain, you need to trigger only 20% of neurons, not every single neuron in yeah. the brain. Yeah, the question is about optimization. Actually, we don't even know enough to uh, answer that question, whether the brain is optimized or not. I think from my experience, uh, you probably have heard that the brain only uses 10% of the, of the neurons. That's completely wrong. The, every brain in every animal is using all the neurons almost all the time. I show you movies of the activity of the brain, and it's similar whether you're using uh, the visual cortex or you're not. So there's something very special about brains. This is a machine that's always on. The only time in which the neurons are off is when you're dead or in coma. Even during sleep, your neurons are extremely active. And we don't know why. We don't know what's going on. What is this spontaneous activity that is permeating the brain? So we have to figure that out first, and then we'll see if it's optimized or not. My intuition, again, this is just an intuition. No, I cannot tell you uh, that this is the way it's going to be, is that evolution has had 700 million years to optimize brains. So I'm pretty sure it's a bloody damn uh, job uh, that evolution has that with our brains. and that. If you look at some parts of the body and the way our design is optimized for the function, I'm sure that uh, the brain circuits are going to be super optimized for, for, for their function. I'll ha find it difficult to improve. It's just my intuition. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no time, unfortunately, but uh, those who haven't asked their questions, you, you can ask uh, these questions to professor during these two days. So, and now we are moving to, thank you very much. <laughs> so now we are moving to industry dialogue, a part of this exciting event. And uh, first, uh, we're gonna listen to the talks of our speakers and after um, the last talk, we're going to have a discussion about um, from bench to bedside topic uh, about the uh, difficulties that we met uh, to move from idea to market and also brainstorm some problems. Please uh, meet uh, Dr. Vaheb Ogosian, who is a head of MEG unit, consultant of neuro navigation, uh, King Fahad Medical City, Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Good afternoon. I, I will talk uh, about a uh, new and emerging approach uh, to diagnosis and uh, treatment of mental illnesses. I will probably speak a little bit fast because I have lost <laughs> slides so to fix in the time. But uh, first I will try to introduce why we need a new approach actually, what is wrong with the old one, and hopefully then I will have some time to show a few examples of what I mean under the new approach. Okay, first, uh, why we need it? Because actually, uh, <coughs> mental illness is perhaps the most serious medical issue worldwide. I mean, you hear all the time about how all the world tries to cure cancer or uh, how to prevent uh, cardiovascular diseases. And you don't hear really about mental illness, but uh, and most people get the impression that these other diseases are more serious. But actually, if you objectively measure Try to quantify, tell which disease is worse, actually, what is bad, basically, of the disease, then the picture is actually very different. And I'm not sure if uh, you're familiar with the uh, terms of this global burden of disease. It's basically a tool which uh, 
evaluates the quantifies actually loss of health due to different diseases, uh, injuries, or um, other factors. Basically, it, it quantifies the loss of health. And there are several different types of measures for this. One of them is uh, while this uh, called uh, years lived with disability. Another popular one is the disability adjusted life years. And these are the things which are used by World Health Organization, other international and national bodies to inform their policies and uh, to uh, make a decision making actually, to how, how to decide about different diseases, how to proceed. Now, if we do this kind of uh, objective measurement, Okay, there is written the names, what kind of diseases are, you don't see it, but this first one, this is a, okay, mental health. I will tell, okay, the numbers. Now, 32%, doesn't, uh, doesn't show well, but anyway, the 32% actually of the global burden of all the diseases is accounted by mental illnesses. Actually, second place, I mean, you don't see it here also, but on the second place are the all other non-communicable diseases. This includes actually cancer, uh, I don't know, what, what other, uh, there are like a lot of respiratory conditions, diabetes, all of these things non-communicable together have less burden than, uh, yeah, than mental uh, illnesses. So objectively, this is really very serious issue. And, but the governments or the World Health Organization or different, they spent much less money actually on this one. For some reason, it doesn't sound that important <laughs> for uh, people. But uh, it's true actually, for all of the measures, if you use even another measure, not this uh, years uh, lived with disability, any other objective measure, uh, mental illnesses are at least in top five always. So this is really much, bad, much worse problem than cardiovascular diseases or uh, Answer. Now, okay, we heard about in this forum and uh, yeah, all the time you hear on TV and on every conference how the, this fast development of technology affected the healthcare sector. How the healthcare is becoming better because of technology, how we live much healthier, we live much longer and better because of technology. And that's true actually for mo most of the diseases. Let's say just a quick example. I think compared to 20, 30 years ago, now 1.1 million people less die from heart attacks than uh, like 30 years ago. So it really affected a lot of it. Now let's see how this technological development affected uh, mental health. Okay, again, you don't uh, see here, but uh, I, these are the numbers I got from World Health Organization. Here is the list starting from 1990 to 2016. The global burden of disease as a proportion of the overall uh, as it is now, we can see that from year to year, actually, it increases instead of decreasing. Actually, it, it's supposed to decrease. The burden of the mental illness increases, and it's not because we became worse at treating it or diagnosing it, or there are more people uh, getting mental health problem. Is that we became better at treating the other diseases, and therefore the proportion of mental health. I mean, we didn't change it from 1960s till now. There is nothing new in treating uh, mental diseases. So, therefore, basically, since all the other, we became better at treating all the other ones, the burden of all the other increased, and so the proportion of uh, mental illness increased year to year. Until now, it, it uh, keeps increasing. Now, okay, why it is it this way? I mean, why, I mean, people want to treat mental uh, disorders, right? But why it is this way? And I think, I, uh, not only I, I think it's a now emerging trend in the field, and even the I think the former director of NIH had several talks on this also. Then it's because look, all the other diseases are deeply rooted in underlying biology. I mean, if you have a heart attack, we know exactly what is happening with the heart. We can do ECG, we can measure objectively, actually quantifiably, we can measure what is happening with the heart. If you break your hand, you go, you do x-ray, you know exactly where it's broken, how it is broken. With uh, mental disorder, it's not like this. It's the only field in the medicine, actually, where the whole diagnosis, actually, is, depends on uh, observed behavior. Basically, doctor looks how you behave, and on the subjective report, you tell, OK, I feel bad, and the last two weeks, did you change your, uh, I don't know, how, did you have a change in appetite last two weeks? Did you feel depressed last two weeks? How many times you were happy? How many times you were not? And then they put the diagnosis. Actually, as far as the diagnosis of mental disorders is concerned, 
these disorders can come from intestines. I mean, there's nobody, no link, actually, when they make the diagnosis, no link really to, under, at least in 99% of mental uh, disorders, there's no link to underlying uh, neurobiology. So, and uh, that's the reason, actually, why, since we don't have these measurements, and there is no link to where all this technological development didn't really affect the mental uh, disorders. Now, if we have such a thing, I mean, and this is a slide I will probably try to go a little bit uh, faster, so to, to reach the later ones, but uh, so if we have, we come up, we can uh, describe the neuro neurobiological mechanism which underlie different mental disorders, and we come up with some biomarkers, diagnostic biomarkers, where we can do your measurement, objective measurement, tell, okay, this person is depressed. So what, what are the advantages? What we can gain from it? Okay, the first thing which, uh, we can gain is the early detection. And early detection with early intervention is now kind of name of the game in medicine everywhere and because the treatment is the most effective at earlier stages. So if we have early detection, then we can. And there is a lot of evidence actually now showing that most of the mental uh, illnesses, they, you can find some precursors in the brain many years before actually the behavior, the, you can see the manifestation in the behavior of a patient. So there are some cases where 10 years before, actually, of the condition, you can already see things. If you could measure, you could screen, like in the cancer case, and find these things, then you will be able to intervene and prevent her. While we intervene in the psychiatry, usually, but you intervene when already the behavior started changing. And that's the last stage already, actually. All of the damage has been done already, actually. And it's very difficult after that to deal with the situation. Now that we will have objective differential diagnosis, actually. We can objectively then diagnose. Now, actually, as I told, I mean, now the diagnosis relies mostly on this uh, DSM, the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Now I think it's the version 5 is the latest version. And there's a basically set of symptoms written, that are 10 symptoms. If you have 5 out of these 10, then you are depressed. If you have, I don't know, 3 out of these, then just go look to some other uh, disease. And then you go check. And uh, there is very big heterogeneity within each condition. Actually, you can be diagnosed, two different people can be diagnosed with the same mental disorder and don't have any overlapping symptoms. They can have completely two different symptoms, but they be diagnosed with the same one. And there is actually opposite also. There is a large homogeneity among different disorders. So you, two people can have exactly the same the brain activity before we start the treatment, which can tell us which effect, let's say, I know the example of a depression. You can go to pharmacotherapy, you can subscribe SSRI drugs, you can go to psychotherapy, or now in our hospital we do also TMS for the refractory cases of depression, the transcranial magnetic stimulation. So, and actually, there are a lot of studies now already kind of showing on the research level. It, this is not still allowed in clinical, actually, uh, practice. But in the research level, there are certain activations in the brain namely in anterior cingulate cortex, who is familiar with the brain activations, uh, which predict actually which therapy will be most beneficial to the patient, psychotherapy or the pharmacological therapy. So we can do the scan and know, rather than send the patient to one therapy and then like six months later, okay, no, we need to change uh, to something else. It can support clinical drug trials actually, is uh, by representing an endpoint. So now what, the way they do the drug trials, you give the drug and then you wait three, four months and then see if it helped or not. But by no means these are only areas involved there, there are millions of them, but these are key areas. And uh, now if we look activation of these areas in depressed patients and in normal, uh, and in a healthy controls, I will show. I mean, there are other biomarkers also, but this is the one we recently got in our lab and this is also confirmed by many other uh, studies also. Therefore. I will show this as a proof of concept that such a thing can be done, actually. Basically, we show the emotional pictures to the patient and recorded their brain activity. So we're showing some bad images, let's say. <laughs> and positive and negative, but the differences we got only when they were viewing negative images, like severed head and really very negative images, actually. And look, this, is, this one shows the activation in amygdala. This is the area here, this activation levels of this area. And this is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is this. I mean, I don't have time to explain why these areas and what are the mechanism involved, but you can clearly see, and, uh, okay, this is uh, for patient activation levels shows, this shows the activation levels for control. So one, very clearly you can see that in amygdala, there is much stronger activation in patients, while 
Opposite is true for those of other prefrontal cortex. The activation is much stronger in uh, healthy individuals than in uh, patients. And this is a very easy way to discriminate, let's say, with patient populations. And this is we got from MEG results. I just don't want to tell that only with MEG you can get. Okay, there are some connectivity issues also. We will jump out of it since there is no time. Uh, so not to tell that only with MEG can be done with advanced techniques. Even with a normal EEG system, which is available in most hospitals from the, in the world. I don't know. Today I asked. Uh, actually, it turns out in Armenia also in the hospitals it is uh, available. There is something called alpha asymmetry, frontal alpha asymmetry, where the two electrodes which are placed here in alpha frequency band, they have uh, different powers. And uh, this one shows for uh, healthy, healthy patients and uh, healthy individuals, and this is for uh, patients with depression. So you can see again that there is this kind of a differential uh, thing. So it's, it, it discriminates, actually. It, it, you can differentiate the patients from uh, controls. Uh, so, okay, my last slide. So, in summary, I like usually putting summaries at the end of my talk. So, now we are actually talking about mental or behavioral disorders. I mean, at first, originally it was mental, but then I think for anti political reasons, I don't want it to be politically correct, started changing the name to behavioral disorder. Now, officially, they are called behavioral disorders. And this uh, behavioral disorder, I mean, we have to move from this concept, actually, the idea is, okay. We have to move from mental, instead of mental or behavior disorder, we have to move to the concept of brain disease. But these are brain diseases and we have to look into the brain and treat the brain rather than some symptoms. And uh, thank you. And the questions Thanks. at the end, right? Probably. Yeah, or we no? have opportunity for two questions, so yes, please. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Actually, you faced with some facts that we usually use when we are speaking about mental disorders. Uh, I just wonder wh how you make sure that these functional biomarkers are specific for depression or for some kind of illness, because as, as you told, there is a huge overlap and also in genes that are responsible for development of these disorders. And I, actually, I have some more questions, but probably we can discuss later in person. Uh, yeah. The question is if they're specific to... Yeah, how, how you make sure that these markers that you were looking for, they are specific for depression or for some yeah, other... At, at the moment, look, at the moment all of these things are on the research level and yeah, we, I, I don't know, maybe this marker that I showed is uh, present also in general anxiety disorder because even with symptoms they overlap a lot. But uh, yeah, we have to actually, it's not, it's, it's still the field is at its beginning of investigation, right? So, but since we're growing fast and the thing is there, I think there is the knowledge has to be there. People have to try to do a lot of this kind of experiments. So then actually we will be able to do. Okay, this specific case that I showed, I think this is specific to uh, depression, not from my own research. I know because I know there are some publications which show that if you select, if you uh, differentiate actually, patients who have even slight anxiety disorder. I mean, in our case, the patients that were selected, we didn't really pay attention. We just made sure that they are more or less purely depressed, but they don't have any other comorbid conditions. But if you can exclude all of these things, I think this effect is not there, actually, So in, in the other conditions. So therefore, uh, probably it's specific. But yeah, it's a research. You have to do it to find out if it becomes Thank you. Yes. No more questions? No? Okay, thank you one more time for a very interesting talk. Dear participants, uh, we are moving to next talk. Uh, please uh, meet Mr. Kirit Velani, who is a managing director of uh, FMD uh, K&L Europe in Armenia. like to welcome everybody. Uh, it's a great forum, great start for Armenia to see all these innovative groups. My talk's slightly different. Uh, I'd like to actually talk about a success story within Armenia, uh, primarily in healthcare. Uh, if, I, if I actually, s let, let me tell you a bit about myself first. My background is uh, primarily offshoring. 
Uh, I'm, I'm from the business arena, IT, etc. I came to Armenia in 2015. I came here to actually hire a few very dedicated scientists. And uh, when I actually got here, I actually discovered gold, right? not physical gold, mine gold, right? very highly educated workforce. I, I've been to Cuba, I've seen the immense talent in Cuba, uh, especially after the Soviet uh, uh, Union collapse, and uh, I saw that there was a huge talent pool of medical professionals uh, throughout the country. Now, in exactly the same way, I discovered the same thing here. Uh, when I say discovered, it was always here. But uh, for, for our company uh, from China, where there was a massive gap between delivery and uh, um, uh, meeting our client needs, you know, it was, it was an amazing thing that we found. And I went back and uh, pitched this to our uh, chairman, who uh, said, fantastic, carry on. Right? So, the, so uh, just a little story about Armenia. And I, I want to actually emphasize the fact that uh, um, we're a global organization uh, with offices throughout the world. Um, we have presence uh, primarily in China for clinical work. So we're the people that actually get the drugs to market. Uh, we provide the, uh, the human resources to actually get the drugs to market. Now, uh, we have offices throughout the world, including uh, India and Bangalore, Bangalore and Hyderabad. Uh, we have about uh, 500 personnel there. And we decided to actually build a center of excellence here in Armenia. This was three years ago. Since then, we've actually grown the organization immensely. Now, a lot of Armenians have always come up to me and say, why the hell Armenia? Well, I gave you half uh, the results. Armenia is a talent pool uh, of highly dedicated resources. Uh, they tend to actually up, uh, end up as exported human resources. We, uh, we, we actually decided that we're gonna give a lot more opportunity here. And the reason why we can do this in Armenia is because of our global presence. Now, uh, the advantages to me straight away, I discovered that Armenians were good at languages. Uh, they, they were very adaptable. Uh, we have a, a whole number of, it's not just about Russian, when the Portuguese speaking personnel actually support our activities uh, in Brazil. That's how far we extend. We do not carry out any studies here in Armenia, uh, and we will look into that at the future stage, where, as the country develops. So the educational elements, that, that's, that, that impressed us immensely. The proximity of Armenia to the rest of the world, four hours from China, uh, three hours from uh, Europe, and US, there's a good four or five hours overlap in terms of work. So as a service industry, it was uh, a, an immense opportunity for us. So I talked about the talent pool. The other thing is, uh, walking around Yerevan and everywhere, I found it very safe. Politically, it's stable. So it was a good, good idea for us to actually uh, uh, set up here. This gives you an indication of uh, our growth. It's, Unfortunately, the site protection is not that fantastic, but we started off in uh, January 22nd, 2015. We established a company. Our first employee uh, was a medical doctor. Uh, he's actually sitting at the back there. Um, he joined the company in March, and we grew from strength to strength. The areas in which we actually uh, do work here, clinical monitoring, to actually protocol design uh, reviews, to data management, to biostatistical programming, to everything. Uh, we literally do it all here. We're a full service clinical research organization. And we've grown from strength to strength. And now uh, uh, on November the 1st, we would be about 220 employees here in Armenia. 
this is uh, we're a quiet organization it's uh, we're not open in, in in the spectrum but we plan to grow even even further uh, we've added uh, um, areas and departments more recently in in the, the field of pharmaceutical safety and we expect that to grow and grow what FMD has done to develop our immune biotech now uh, we've opened our the, uh, a large biotechnology park uh, here in Yerevan um, we've introduced uh, uh, you know nice features like daycare and everything so we built it to uh, very much European and US standards uh, many of our doctors actually uh, came up to us and said Kirit how do we actually improve the healthcare within Armenia we're, we're naturally uh, working on uh, uh, producing uh, and helping uh, drugs get to market how do we do something for Armenia itself so what we thought is well we could either bring trials here but that that's a long way off so we decided to change the mental state of uh, an understanding of uh, the Armenian healthcare system so we decided a campaign of GCP training, good clinical practice training. And uh, so far, we've trained our doctors and physicians free of charge, have trained 480 Armenian professionals in GCP. Um, now within our complex, we have 200 plus specialists in regulatory affairs to all the fields that I already mentioned. So, in the regulatory affairs uh, arena, we're not only hiring uh, life sciences professionals, we're actually hiring linguists. Because if, if at the end of the day, uh, if we're delivering to countries like South America uh, or Europe, we need linguists to actually make sure that. So we, as a company, actually train up the pe personnel to actually deliver that. So they're making a massive contribution to the biotech industry globally but actually lo uh, they, their actually presence is local um, basically uh, how do we introduce uh, yeah, one thing uh, one thing one beneficial thing about uh, uh, healthcare most countries around the world have an integrated healthcare system uh, between uh, the universities and uh, the healthcare delivery centers most of the pioneering hospitals are actually linked to universities. Um, in Armenia, that's not fully the case uh, as yet. And the understanding of clinical uh, research is at its infancy stages. So uh, where in Georgia or in other countries, uh, we may uh, be able to receive a pacemaker free of charge because uh, it's associated with a new product or a stent uh, with uh, um, drug eluted uh, properties, we, we, can't, we don't actually get that here because there is no clinical research uh, infrastructure in place. But it's getting there. Um, biotech regulation within Armenia, our com company is actually contributing directly to the, with the Ministry of Health in actually formulating the rules and regulations there. So that's an improvement for, for the country itself. Um, I'll skip more. I'll, key, key success points, uh, it's very hard to see the little writing there, but uh, we've had sustainable growth. Uh, as university graduates came, came out, we had a program of actually um, passing expertise from throughout the world to our professionals here. The biggest uh, drawback to, for Armenia is really uh, experience. Now, what we've done is, we, as a company, we brought global experience to Armenia by uh, bringing in professionals uh, from throughout the world to, to the Armenian market to work here. We've also sent our professionals here in Armenia to work in our China organization for six months. This way, we've actually brought the stamp of experience back to Armenia. In the past, as, as people graduate, they do as much as they can within country and then they go abroad. We, we actually believe that we've actually slowed down that trend 
uh, by actually having a presence here. Um, the, the little wordings above uh, the, the childcare centre, happy families, happy workers, uh, ha happy company. Uh, we believe in that strategy and we've adopted that from day one. Uh, we, as, a, as a fascinating wall in between t our main front doors um, where the, the kids go through one side and the parents go through the other side. A, a lovely glass panel. We call it the crying wall. All right? Not the wailing wall, but the crying wall. But after the first two, two visits, the children stop crying. It's, it's the bye-bye wall. Uh, we have good ethical practices uh, within the com uh, company. We blood donate, uh, we support ORAN and many other uh, uh, organizations from Mother Teresa, Orphanage, etc. We built that into the culture of the organization. So what is our vision for the next 10 years for Armenia? Our target is to actually end up with uh, 500 specialists within Armenia. Uh, that's, that's the sustainable amount. We're working with the universities to make sure that the supply of professionals is, is definitely there. Uh, building, a, uh, building up the professional uh, uh, people that can actually deliver uh, professional services, this will encourage manufacturers, uh, will encourage biotech research into Armenia. That, that is our primary aim. If, if we've got the stamp of experience within the country, there's certainly a chance of actually encouraging others to actually develop. And uh, the wishes of our staff is primarily to improve healthcare within the country. So our ultimate aim is to make sure that the legislation and uh, rules and regulations are there so that we can actually bring, and, uh, bring trials to Armenia. Uh, it would be good if we could actually compete on a level playing field and uh, uh, the trials actually end up here. Uh, the, uh, there are multiple steps that we're taking with other manufacturers to make sure that uh, w the correct data is available from hospitals so we know what the patient population is like, the prevalence of certain diseases, and we're making inroads into actually uh, do that. Uh, connecting up e-health systems, etc. Um, th this is a very contentious side. I always compare Armenia with Austria. Uh, you know, people, I, more often than not, people snigger and laugh. Uh, it's not far away from the truth. Austria, uh, historically, um, it's, it has good universities. It also has a uh, a uh, prevalence uh, uh, of biotech uh, con countries around it, Germany, etc. Well, Armenia is not far off of that. Uh, um, all we have to do is to get ourselves organized and we'll end up with a biotech ecosystem that can actually deliver to the rest of the world. But main, 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 uh, uh, I, I do apologize for that. Uh, main, uh, if anyone wants the slides, I can send it to them main uh, problems uh, and hurdles that we've overcome is uh, we work well with the government, uh, universities and the medical community and now we're actually working well with the diaspora. The diaspora I have a lot of influence around the world and are key uh, decision makers uh, and they, if they know that we have the ability to deliver uh, from university level to uh, where we are at the research level, they will actually be able to make the correct decisions and actually make sure that uh, we can actually continue. And thank you. Thank you very much, but please stay. I think some of participants will have questions. No? No questions? Oh, a lot of <laughs> But we have opportunity only for two questions. <laughs> no, no, just two questions. Hi, Kirit. So I really enjoyed the uh, presentation, so thank you for that. I guess my question would be, are you actually seeing opportunities for Armenian companies 
to actually start contracting your services? Or are you seeing most of the opportunities from companies outside Armenia actually using this as effectively a transport service? Good, good question. Uh, we're seeing opportunities from all areas. Uh, Armenian companies who have uh, uh, produced products, they're asking questions about how we, they can actually have access to the, uh, the China market. And uh, because we have a global presence, uh, we're able to talk in Armenian to the, to the business community here and give them a concept of how to actually uh, uh, get access and what's involved, etc. Because we have uh, the counter departments within mainland China, as we hear, like the regulatory departments, which uh, would help get their products to market. Uh, also, we're seeing a massive amount of interests uh, from within the CIS region. Uh, th there are a lot of uh, European uh, US companies wanting access to uh, uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, uh, even Iran. So we have a, a good presence here in Armenia geographically, as well as that language capabilities that will allow us to have access to those markets. Questions? Thank you for the talk. It was very inspiring for me as Armenian. So you mentioned this gap between the science, uh, the life scientific part and the healthcare system. Uh, do you see some solution in observable future, not, not after a 10 year, but maybe a bit closer? Yes, uh, that's a very good question. I'll just repeat it. Uh, how, how do we bridge the gap between clinical uh, health healthcare delivery, uh, the research element? Um, well, at the, if I look at the quantity of uh, applications to the drug agencies uh, in Armenia, it's a, it's, it numbers about five, five applications a year. Um, I believe in baby steps. And uh, what we have done is, uh, within our organization, we've uh, built a clinic to actually deliver cosmetics, cosmetic uh, products. So, it, it, uh, and uh, creams, etc. Uh, things that are of non-medical uh, use, but still have to go through the same level of regulation. So we will try, start off uh, with baby steps, maybe shampoo studies, etc here in Armenia, this will actually inject good capital into the uh, Armenian population, they get free product, etc. And uh, will exercise the rules and regulations within Armenia. So therefore, that's the way we will actually get uh, start within this market. And remember one thing, Armenia is a small country. It, it, it takes a lot for the likes of GSK to actually carry out a study here. But there are rare diseases where the patient population is not uh, in huge numbers. And uh, uh, that's where maybe if we get ourselves organized, uh, know, that, know the prevalence of different diseases, know the key opinion leaders, form a catalog of this, of this type, we can actually uh, work with the, the drug, drug companies that we already work with and maybe uh, have that have those studies come to Armenia. This will help the doctors as well as uh, helping the patients themselves, especially chronic diseases like Crohn's disease or mental disorder diseases. Thank you very much. And now, uh, please meet uh, Dr. Humain David Temati, who is adjunct assistant clinical professor at the University of Southern uh, California, Keck School of Medicine, uh, co-founder and chief scientist officer at uh, Levation Pharma, and uh, co-founder and chief scientist officer, uh, Optigo Biopharmaceuticals in USA. All right, thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank uh, Armin Arugian and all the organizers for uh, inviting me here. Um, I want to talk about uh, a topic that's near and dear to me, uh, exosomes and secretomes uh, derived from stem cells and their use as a cell-free uh, stem cell-like therapeutic and uh, with a focus on the eye. And so my background is uh, I got my start in science in, in stem cell research. 
I uh, started in, in Irv Weissman's lab at Stanford uh, back in the early 90s as an undergraduate. I was 17 years old and uh, worked on this thing called stem cells, which uh, hadn't been known uh, about much before then and uh, happened to be involved in the early uh, purification and characterization of bone marrow stem cells, of the hematopoietic stem cells, and uh, really fell in love with their potential. Uh, you know, we would, we would irradiate mice, transplant the cells into the mice just by injecting into the vessels, and all of a sudden a new uh, immune system and a new set of blood would magically grow out of them. And so um, that got me very interested in the field, and uh, I went on to medical school, and then I went on uh, to do a PhD at Caltech, and over there, I decided to study uh, nervous system stem cells, so uh, stem cells in the brain, and uh, ended up uh, not studying their therapeutic potential, but rather ended up showing how they can contribute to cancer. But nonetheless, I maintained my interest in, in the field, and uh, then I became an ophthalmologist, and uh, it was during uh, a residency that I realized that there were a lot of patients who we treat in ophthalmology who, even though we treat the overall disease process, such as the inflammation or the neovascularization that may lead to damage in the retina, um, even though that's gone after we treat it, their vision doesn't return. And that made me wonder, what can we do to try to protect the, ne the neural tissue in the retina uh, from damage? What can we get it to, to do to get it to regenerate? And how can we support uh, the tissue overall so that even when uh, the disease process is gone, the vision doesn't deteriorate permanently and lead to, lead to blindness or vision loss. And so um, it, it was in recent years that uh, ever since I was a, a fellow that I was introduced to the field of stem cell derived exosomes. And I want to talk about three different uh, companies that I've been involved with, one of which is, is uh, currently that deal in this, in this field as it relates to the eye. Um, so uh, just in terms of my own, uh, I like to be transparent about all the things that I'm doing. Uh, I'm currently, I have stock or ownership or consulting in, in a handful of companies over here and I'm gonna talk about just a few of them. Um, so what are exosomes, what do they do? So, uh, and I apologize for this being so blurry. Um, so exosomes are essentially very tiny uh, vesicles uh, that are about 30 to 150 nanometers in size and they contain mostly different types of RNA, um, like non-coding RNA, microRNAs, and others, as well as a protein cargo. And uh, they're secreted by every cell in culture, uh, and they're found in all body, bodily fluids. In fact, if you go and buy milk, uh, or in breast milk, if you buy beer, uh, in synovial fluid, in blood, anywhere you look, uh, they're going to be exosomes. Uh, and the fact that you drink breast, uh, you know, uh, cow's milk doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be uh, genetically reprogrammed in any way by the exosomes in the milk, but who knows, you might be. Uh, so it's actually a very interesting uh, field of research, and, and, uh, and, and you know, a lot of people are actually looking at these substituents. Uh, they're secreted by all cells in culture and in vivo, um, like we talked about, and they have many important functions, and so we'll talk about those. In terms of the function of, of exosomes, uh, or, or sorry, in terms of the uh, properties of exosomes, when you look in the middle of this slide, you'll see that there are some early endosomes, and th those lead down below to these multi-vesicular um, endosomes, and eventually they butt off these exosomes, uh, as you can see in the right side of the image. And so, what are the different functions of, uh, of exosomes? And I'm sorry about the, uh, the yellow here. They can get rid of um, obsolete material in the cell, trash, and this is what they were thought to have as their primary function for, for a long time. Um, they can be involved in angiogenesis, um, pro-inflammation, anti-inflammation, uh, coagulation. Uh, in cancer, they can be involved in dissemination of some of the oncogenes and, and cancer uh, related molecules. They can be involved in the spread of pathogens like prions. But the reason why we have a therapeutic interest in them is they can deliver uh, macromolecular messages such as MR, uh, uh, RNAs and proteins from one cell to another and, and do signaling. What's interesting about the field of exosomes uh, as well as what, I, what we call secretome, which is not just the exosome but it's the entire set of exosomes, other extracellular vesicles and proteins that are secreted by, by cells is that in the case of stem cells, in many uh, uh, cases, the secretome and the exosomes in particular can recapitulate the therapeutic benefit of the stem cells. So what are some examples? And I don't want to put everything in slides, so you have to listen to me. Um, so, so hematopoietic stem cells, you know, from the bone marrow, we know that we inject them into an animal. Those cells will actually engraft and create new cells, right? We know neural stem cells, when you inject them into a spinal cord of an injured uh, animal, 
whether it be a human or a mouse, they engraft and they lead to the production of new neurons. But when you look at other types of stem cells, uh, they don't engraft, but nonetheless, they lead to resolution of inflammation, reduction of fibrosis, and healing uh, and, 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 and ultimate regeneration of the tissue. So for example, um, in the retina, there is a company called j that takes retinal pigment epithelial precursors or progenitor cells and uh, injects it directly into the eye, not in any particular place, just into the vitreous of the eye. And those, those eyes heal largely in patients with retinitis pigmentosa, other retinal degenerative diseases. But when you look at the retina of the patient or the animal, you can't find those donor-derived cells. Why? Because they're secreting something. When you look at uh, you know, patients who get amniotic membrane uh, put on, the, on their eye after a serious injury, right? Uh, after they've had an alkali chemical injury, for example, you don't see placental cells from a donor growing on the eye, but rather you do see uh, regeneration. And similarly, I worked at a company, and we'll talk about it in a moment, called Capricor, when you uh, have, a, have an animal or a human with a diseased heart that's had an infarction, that's had inflammation, and you deliver via the intracoronary vessels or systemically cardiac stem cells, that heart muscle can largely repair itself. However, uh, you don't see donor-derived cells in the body. And finally, with mesenchymal stem cells, which are derived from the fats or bone marrow or other areas, you, when you deliver them to a patient who has any one of thousands of different inflammatory diseases like Crohn's or colitis or, or rheumatoid arthritis or Sjogren's, you don't see those mesenchymal stem cells necessarily going into anywhere and regenerating tissue. Rather, they must be secreting something by which they influence um, their, their capabilities. So on this slide here, you, it just shows the complexity of exosomes. And I don't want to go through every single piece, but other, rather to just show that exosomes are complex. They, could, they contain lots of different transmembrane molecules like you see at the bottom in yellow and red, like the tetraspanins. They contain a lot of different endosomal molecules. They have a whole bunch of different types of lipids like phosphatidylserine, cholesterol, uh, ceramides. There are multiple different RNA molecules, and there are all sorts of cytoskeletal molecules like actin uh, and tubulin and various adhesion molecules like the ICAMs, uh, integrins, etc. They do have some degree of antigen-presenting molecules and, and MHCs, but to a lower degree than you see on, on actual cell types themselves. And one thing that makes exosomes uh, therapeutically very interesting is that they're not as immunogenic uh, as the cells from which they're derived. And so they can be a nice off-the-shelf biologic, even if they're uh, allogeneic and come from a different donor um, than, than the cells themselves. And so uh, that's also appealing. And uh, I'm not going to be talking about the bioengineering of exosomes, but I did want to put a slide on it um, to, sh to, to talk about how there are companies like uh, Kodiak in Boston that was started by our very own uh, Nubar Afayan, who that are focused on not taking endogenous, naturally occurring exosomes, but rather engineering them to act as delivery vehicles for various proteins, various microRNAs, or a cocktail of them, almost like using them as, as viruses, right? Because they act in a similar way, but to act as, as a more endogenous type of viral delivery system, with one that is more compatible with the, with the body, more, more uh, natural to the cells, rather than acting as a pathogenic uh, invader that could potentially damage those cells. So um, that's an entirely different field. The other field of exosomes that I haven't talked about and I won't address too much uh, is in exosome diagnostics. So when you think about cancer, for example, cancer cells can secrete their own uh, signature of exosomes, right? And so there are quite a few companies that are working on what we call liquid biopsies that uh, have identified the signature of exosomes that are secreted into the bloodstream by various different types of cancer. And you can uh, imagine going to the doctor, getting your blood drawn, in addition to checking your blood counts and your cholesterol and your serum chemistries, etc. you can also ch uh, screen for these different exosomes by looking for the specific species of microRNAs or proteins that are upregulated uh, in them uh, and, and use them as cancer biomarkers for diagnostic purposes and, and for tracking the response to therapy. So there's a lot of excitement around, around that as well. Um, so what are the advantages of stem cell secretomes in general and of exosomes? So first, they, they, they can recapitulate the regenerative and, and, and or anti-inflammatory properties of the stem cells, but they're cell-free like we talked about. They can be off the shelf not, and have less immunogenicity, and they can be more easily modified uh, or manipulated in the parent cells, right? We talked about if, if you're doing gene therapy on a cell and getting it to permanently transform and permanently express a, a gene is much more uh, challenging than just packaging something into an exosome. Um, 
And so there are a lot of companies working on exosome or secretome therapeutics. Uh, and out of all of these, uh, like I said, uh, number four, Kodiak, was started by, by Nubar. And uh, three of these, by complete coincidence, I've had an opportunity to, to work with, uh, one of which is currently. And so I'd like to talk about those three and, and kind of at a high level without drilling down into the very specific detail, A, because of time, and B, because of the resolution of the slides. Uh, so, so we can talk about kind of in general what, what's happening with this field and what, what's, what's going to be developing in the future. One thing I'll talk about bef right before this is that all of this sounds very exciting, right? But in order to turn this into a therapeutic, um, we have, to, we have to do what our, what our previous speaker had, had kindly discussed with us and go through a very exhaustive set of GCP, ICH, you know, guidelines, uh, regulatory approvals, uh, and, and whatnot to get this into humans, to do so safely, and to do so in a way that regulatory bodies like the FDA in the United States and the EMEA in, in Europe and, and other agencies will actually accept for approval of a therapeutic product. So this is just all really the beginning of a very complex path that involves uh, you know, validation of this as a therapeutic product, including characterization of the, of the product. So, um, so here's, here's some, some high level experience. First is a company called Cellcare. I'm working with Cellcare right now as, the, uh, as a de facto chief medical officer. Um, we're based in Los Angeles and we do re regenerative immunotherapy for retinal diseases. So. Um, in the, in the top is a picture of a, a needle going into an eye. Uh, patients with diabetic retinopathy, people who have severe diabetes that's poorly treated or untreated, tend to get neovascularization and inflammation in the retina, which can lead to vision loss. And if you see this image down below, basically what, what you're getting is activated immune cells that lead to occlusion of the capillaries in, in the retina. Uh, those occluded capillaries then uh, lead to ischemia, leading to neovascularization. And so we currently treat the inflammation, currently we treat the neovascularization, but there's nothing that really treats the underlying um, process and, and, and modulates the immune system and suppresses the neovascularization. So this is just talking about um, you know, an image showing how the exosomes can come from the mesenchymal stem cells. These are uh, adipose derived that we use. And uh, you know, we talk, the, the image below talks about how we can do scalable manufacturing um, to separate out the exosome and soluble fractions, create a uh, shelf-stable biologic in a little vial that we can then inject. Um, and this is what an image on the top left of what an eye with diabetic retinopathy looks like. All of these yellow spots and red spots, that's not good, essentially. The red is blood and the yellow is lipid. You get a lot of exudation and you see the image below in the green and blue. All those dark spots in the center, this is a cross-section of the retina. Um, this, this, that shouldn't be there. That's fluid, it's lipid, it's blood. And that's what re re results in about 40% of patients having a suboptimal response to steroids and anti-VEGF, uh, you know, neovascular uh, blocking agents. So um, our goal is to stop that. And, and, and what, what, ca what cell care is doing is taking mesenchymal stem cells, which a lot of people have used, and rather than taking just their exosomes, stimulating those exosomes with TNF-alpha interferon gamma, and simulating an inflammatory environment. Essentially, it's telling those mesenchymal stem cells, it's tricking them into believe that they're in a pro-inflammatory environment. And, and when you do that, those mesenchymal stem cells start to secrete a large amount of anti-inflammatory uh, properties like TSG6, TIMP1, so, uh, supraocyte dismutase 2 and 3, and, and uh, eventually they have a, a potent anti-inflammatory response across a, a variety of different uh, you know, studies that, that, that I'm not going to go into because of time. Um, this is a picture of a, a VEGF-mediated fibrosis model in the, in the retina of a rabbit. And uh, you see what the baseline is on the left. In the middle, VEGF um, plus saline. And you see lots of, in, in, in that black in the center, fibrotic masses in black. And on the right, you see treated with our product, and, and those fibrotic, fibrotic masses essentially disappear. Um, and uh, this is just a slide showing that the vision of, of animals who've gotten a blast injury, like a, like a mechanical injury to the brain uh, with damage to the retina actually can be improved. Um, and uh, so, so this is now another company called Capricor, cardiac stem cell therapeutics company. Uh, and this is a company that's, that uh, has been developing cardiac stem cells as a therapy for cardiac disease and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Same sort of anti-inflammatory and pro-regenerative properties. 
And uh, this company uh, decided to develop the exosomes from those cardiac stem cells as a therapeutic agent. And I worked on it in the eye as well as other indications. Um, this shows kind of the different types of species of microRNAs. It's difficult to read, but there are many microRNA types like MIR-146, MIR-210, uh, and various types of proteins that are upregulated, which in green in the, in the cardiac exosomes compared to in red, the dermal fibroblast exosomes. So they have a particular signature. Um, and uh, this just shows the exosome manufacturing method with, with certain ultracentrifugation, filtration methods. There are also precipitation methods. And uh, essentially, this shows that the exosomes from the cardiac stem cells have very low immunogenicity compared to the cells that they're derived from. Um, and uh, we did a study in, in the eye exposing the eye to an alkali chemical injury in rats and measured uh, to see how much uh, damage there was at various points after delivering these exosomes via injection around the eye. And uh, basically, you see in the blue is the amount of damage to the eye via two different measurements. And in both cases, there's a significant uh, improvement after delivery of these exosomes to the eye, which is a really big deal because these eyes naturally don't heal. As you see, the, un the untreated, they remain damaged uh, for good. And those, if, if it's in a human, that patient will lose their eye. So it's actually very profound data. And the FDA saw this and, and really uh, got excited about developing a therapy around it. Uh, we also uh, did a study in autoimmune-related uh, ocular surface inflammation in rabbits, and uh, this image just basically shows that there was a significant drop after both the exposures to the, uh, to the CDC EV exosomes on the left compared to the vehicle in the amount of inflammation on the surface of the eye. And the final company, which I'll r race through since my time is up, is a company called Noviome. I'm still involved with them a little bit. They're doing placental or amniotic membrane exosomes, so whenever a baby is born, the placenta uh, you know, is known to secrete exosomes into the amniotic fluid, which is why if you, if you try to cut uh, a fetus in utero, it doesn't form a scar. It's, it's these exosomes from the amniotic uh, membrane that, that prevent that scarring. And so this company is uh, looking at those as a therapeutic. And basically, um, they showed that retinal ganglion cell and, uh, uh, neuroprotection can occur after optic nerve trauma. Um, by delivering the exosomes in, an, in the nose, which is very, very interesting. So you create a nasal spray, it reaches the optic nerve, and it prevents death of the optic nerve cells and the retinal ganglion cells. And so the red line here is the um, vision uh, after uh, the crush injury. The green line is the vision uh, in, in the same sort of animals treated with the exosomes, and the black line is what normal is. So you get 50% uh, return to normal. And this slide shows that you reverse demyelination or prevent demyelination in that same optic nerve crush injury. Um, and there's quite a few other things that I'm not going to go into. So that completes it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have questions? Of course, <laughs> we have. Thanks very much. Probably not a scientific question, but somewhere related. So how you protect your IP simultaneously publishing the results? So how do you protect the IP and simultaneously publish the results? Yes. So uh, first, uh, in terms of IP, what's, uh, I'm glad you asked this question. We actually had a discussion about it this morning uh, at a different panel session. Uh, you know, in the US, at least, you can't get IP on a product of nature, right? So if something's a product of nature and you just take it out of the body or out of an animal cell line, uh, you can't patent it. What you can patent, however, are the processes and the methods of use. So for example, with the uh, cardiac stem cell derived exosomes, there is a patented manufacturing process to take uh, the, the, the cardiac stem cells from nature, create what's called cardiosphere derived cells out of them by doing sphere cultures, planing them down in a monolayer, taking the exosomes, and then doing a specific uh, method of ultracentrifugation, filtration, and separation by size in order to get the therapeutic product, right? And, and showing that that's different than the product of nature. Um, and, and, and similarly with cell care, it's the stimulation with interferon gamma and TNF alpha, which is a non-natural process, right? That's not something that is obvious, and so you can get IP around that. In terms of publication, uh, basically what you need to do is file the patents before you publish it. So, I, so it's before it goes into a journal, before I can speak about it in this talk, which counts as publication, uh, before putting it in a poster, website, Facebook post, blog, any of that can destroy your chance of getting 
a publication? And it's actually a good question you know, to ask because for, for those in the audience who are at the early stages of their career, uh, learn from me because I've made those mistakes. And I, you know, I, in one case when I was at MIT, I had a really nice uh, invention in a drug delivery system, which could have been a very big deal and others have done similar things, but were smart enough to patent it beforehand. And because I you know, did a little poster just so I could go and present it at a, at a meeting in Florida and have a nice little vacation out of it, uh, that poster, which I thought was insignificant, ended up blocking my own ability to, 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 to patent that, that discovery. So uh, always patent first before you publish. Question back here? Yes. Can, can you actually package extant exosomes with cargo molecules of your choice? And if not, can you construct exosomes from scratch? Uh, so so yes, yes to both. Uh, and so that's what I was getting at uh, before. The customized or bioengineered exosomes are becoming a very hot thing. And, and so Nubar uh, his his uh, company Kodiak in Boston is, is probably the leader. Uh, globally in that, in that field of engineered exosomes. They're taking uh, various types of cells, manipulating them with all sorts of therapeutic cargo. Uh, they're being very stealth about it, so they're not going into detail about what that cargo is or what the indications are. We'll find out soon enough. Um, but basically what they're trying to do is, is to use the exosomes that they have engineered as a means of delivering proteins and RNAs, similar to how we're currently doing it with viruses. Right? Because viruses have strong immunogenicity in many cases, except for the AAVs. They also have you know, certain specific levels of expression. They can be damaging to the host cell that they infect. Right? They may have transient expression, and whatever they deliver may not uh, you know, survive and may be diluted after multiple uh, cell divisions. Exosome therapies may circumvent that and may be a lot easier to package and, and deliver. In terms of uh, your other question was about... Um, yeah, yeah, so yes, there are people uh, who have been working in the academic setting in terms of making uh, artificial exosomes. It's similar to the creation of liposomes, but obviously a lot more uh, complex. So, so that there is a strong interest in that for obvious reasons, right? So you don't res uh, rely on very complicated cell manufacturing uh, facilities. And, and, and I have no doubt that eventually that's where things will go, but for the time being, we're, it's kind of like the monoclonal antibody industry. If you have a cell that produces them, um, there's no need to necessarily engineer them uh, because it could actually be cheaper to get them from a cell source that's immortalized rather than going to, uh, you know, an artificial manufacturing process. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, let's take our, dear guests, let's take our places to have a talk about bench to bench side. Uh, bedside, uh, dear Dr. Vahe Borosian, uh, Kirit Velani, and uh, uh, David uh, Hemati. First of all, uh, thank you for very interesting talks and inspiring talks because um, as most of participants are from Armenia, we have uh, not a problem, but uh, still uh, we have few attempts uh, to go from idea to market. So I would like to hear from you some suggestions. Uh, uh, how to deal with problems, how, do, how you did that, and um, uh, what, what kind of um, solutions uh, you, you did, like extraordinary solutions which help, which help you a lot. Uh, so I guess I'll start since you're looking at me. Um, so, so it's interesting. So a field, field like exosomes, uh, it didn't exist until very recently, right? So because that field didn't exist, there was no regulatory precedent, right? There was nothing that we could look at that other people had done to, to form the basis of what we did, um, you know, at, at Capricor, for example. So when we were trying to create an IND or an investigational new drug um, application, we didn't want to go to the FDA and only to be told that everything we had done is wrong and have to redo it, which would bankrupt the company, delay the technology, right, and, and, and waste years and years of, you know, of, of, of our time. So instead, what, what we did is we thought about this rationally. Uh, 
we worked with you know CROs who are who are experts at the regulatory path, right? Who've done self similar things like cell therapy. So rather than exosomes, we figured this is close enough to cell therapy. So we worked with with these kinds of groups, and it's very important to engage with experts who've done clinical trials in that field to understand, okay, what, what's similar to this? Second, uh, we hired, you know, regulatory experts who, who you know, knew the field uh, from, from the FDA's perspective and knew what they were looking for, right? And then finally, uh, we decided to be as thorough as possible, right? So because there was no obvious precedent, we said we're going to do as many small experiments as possible you know, so, you know, tons of different small immunogenicity studies, small biodistribution studies, small toxicology studies, things like that to kind of really ask, you know, to show to the FDA and have a very thorough package. And so when we went to the FDA with our pre-IND uh, briefing packet, they were very impressed. And they said, look, we're very happy that you're teaching us. And it's very rare for the FDA to say that they're learning from a company. But in our case, they said, look, you clearly have shown that you didn't try to cut corners, you didn't try to hide anything, and you were very thorough with what you did, and they appreciated that. And because of that, they, they, they gave us a green light to continue doing what we'd been doing. And, and, and had we not done that, I, I know what they would have done. They would have told us to do tons of other things that we couldn't afford and didn't have time to do, uh, or may have just shut down the program because they were uncertain of the safety or other aspects of it. So I, I think being thorough and talking to the right experts is, is very important. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the same question? Yeah. Just, is that, just, just by having a presence here of a large CRO within Armenia will give opportunities for many research uh, organizations uh, to actually establish them themselves here. Uh, companies like yourself could actually have an R&D element within Armenia. We're discussing it. <laughs> good idea. Yeah. Uh, this gives a, a good foundation. Uh, having the, having uh, 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 an organization like us being here for three years with 250 odd professionals who are actually carry out, carrying out this sort of work for companies around the world. The expertise is here, it's local. It uh, has started a small sort of ecosystem in its own right. Uh, it makes it cost effective for people to just knock on our door and come up and ask, ask our professionals uh, how, how, how best to do this. And they know how it's done because they do it for all of our uh, significant clients around the world. Sure. Uh, yes, at the moment, so significant so uh, there, there are biosimilar labs, uh, there's a, a single biosimilar lab, but uh, in, in, in volume terms, no. Thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Pogosian, um, I have, uh, I'm curious about, I know that you switched from mathematics to neuroscience, so can you uh, just uh, you know, how, how do you decide that to do? Oh, yeah, by accident, <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, graduated here from uh, applied mathematics from the European. No. Hello. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. That's it. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I graduated from Yerevan State University, Department of Applied Mathematics, and uh, I got a contract to work in Japan as a software developer, so I went to Tokyo as a software developer. But it was a brain science institute where I was working, and after, I think, a year or two working there, I was offered to do a PhD there, so I did PhD in neurophysiology. Just because, you know, I was young at the time, didn't really plan, and they suggested to stay in Japan to a PhD. So, well, why not? I mean, so I did it. So little accidentally happened, and I <laughs> did the PhD. <laughs> so, but I, say, I didn't have original plan. You know, I didn't uh, plan to become a neurophysiologist or clinician. Actually, my last position, the last two years, I'm working as a clinician also. So, which... <laughs> Very interesting. And uh, what do you think, um, 
how long it will take to develop uh, good markers for these diseases and uh, that they will become like mass market uh, okay. application? I think not too long because uh, now also in the US the NIH uh, started this uh, framework program which is ARDO called the research domain criteria where they actually basically they also tell that uh, it's a it's, it's not a, actually one program. It's just a general framework for uh, finding markers for a neuropsychiatry, for psychiatric condition, and not only to find the markers to them, just to explain the diseases. So to relate, basically, to correlate the mental disorder with the brain. Mm -hmm. So and uh, they they put, I think, a lot of uh, funding in it. There are a lot of grants now, and. There is basically a lot of interest. Now, last couple of years, there is a big interest of uh, finding neurobiological markers for uh, mental uh, disorders. And I hope, uh, yeah, I would say maybe to be in clinical use, maybe five, ten years. Five, ten years? Yeah, to, to be clinically <laughs> used. I mean, I think in five years, probably, it will be already proven that this thing works and uh, it's okay, but then again, they know the regulatory things. It has to go through FDA approvals. It has to go through a lot of steps before we will be allowed to use this thing in the clinical practice. Okay, as I see, we have three minutes and we have, uh, we, uh, also participants can ask questions, so please, if you have questions. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a question to the panel. Um, now, you three of you are in, uh, in medicine as well as in business. So, um, let's start from Hamad. How do you charge your time? Now, you answered the IP, uh, so I assume the IP is a joint. You're also a mentor to several of companies. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, how do you split the, first of all, how do you split the IP or you don't? Um, that's one question. And second is, um, how do you charge your, your, uh, your time among the several companies that you work with? And similarly to uh, Kirill and similarly to uh, Balsia. So, so your first question was about IP. Yeah. Right? And, and, and how I deal with IP with, with respect to different companies, right? Right. So, so uh, because I do different things, um, what, I, what, what I make sure to do is to carve out IP in, in like a legal contract uh, in advance of engaging with any company. So, for example, um, when, uh, before I joined uh, Capricorn back in 2015, um, I had invented something, a totally different drug, uh, for ophthalmology, actually an aesthetic product that raises up the eyelids, and uh, had been working on it uh, on my own, and w but, but I hadn't filed any patents or done anything related to it, and I didn't want Capricorn to own that intellectual property because I you know, was, was working on it while I was their employee, and so I made sure that my employment contract specifically carved that out. And similarly, whenever um, I, I join a company or consult for a company or, or I'm involved in any regard, I make sure that the language of the contract, and I just did that a few weeks ago, uh, the language is always written to reflect that whatever IP I generate uh, in the scope of my, my, narrowly defined scope of my work for them uh, is, assigned to, is assigned to that company and, and not so broadly. Uh, and I also make sure to be transparent, right, and disclose what else I'm doing, like I, like I did right now, so that everybody who I work with is well aware of everything else that I'm doing, and so in case they perceive a conflict uh, at least they, you know, it's been dealt with and we can discuss it so there isn't a, a, a future conflict. Um, you're doing it in their premise or you're doing it in your premise? Uh, so, so everything I do on my own is virtual. I don't have like labs. Uh, I use CROs and I think it's a much more efficient way uh, of doing things, especially if there are CROs on the preclinical side or clinical side that have expertise in a certain area, there's no need for me to go and, you know, rent real estate, hire employees, you know, just to have them sitting around much of the time, you know, um, and, and this way I can be a lot more efficient. So out of one little, you know, one room office, I'm, you know, I'm running a couple of companies and then advising quite a few uh, others. And so, uh, and with respect to kind of my time, it all really depends on, on what's happening. You know, there, there are weeks when I only have to work, you know, 
20 or 30 hours. There are other weeks when I work 90 hours, uh, all depending on how busy you know, each of the different things are. And, and ultimately what will probably happen or hopefully happen is that you know, one or two of these things will, will really take off and, and be busy enough to, to be my, my full-time or at least almost full-time uh, endeavor. That would be nice. Well, with respect to uh, our, CR, our CRO or other CROs, uh, we're on the deli delivery end of services. So uh, in, in basic form, depending on the client, uh, we could, uh, if they have high volume of work, we, we charge by the work, uh, workload. Uh, if it's uh, piecemeal work uh, where uh, we can actually charge at an hourly rate, we do that. We price locally, as we're a global organization, our clients are multinational, they know what the prices are throughout the world, so we price locally and they get very efficient results from Armenia. Thank you. Uh, and I, wanna... I think my, my work is a little different, it's not business to charge per hour, actually, so I don't know how they, uh, in my case it's different a little. So it's not a private company to do, I mean I work in a hospital. And uh, can I ask last question, just a message? Uh, I'd like you to give a message to scientists like uh, 3K habits that they need to adopt or develop to be successful uh, in a beginning from idea to market. Just three things that is very necessary. Uh, I, I think my, my biggest piece of advice uh, is to uh, don't believe people when they tell you that you're crazy or stupid. Unless you are crazy or stupid, but even then, maybe uh, may, you know, may, maybe things will work. And, and, and you know, when I was uh, when I was in medical school and, and doing my PhD, I had this idea that everybody said was crazy and stupid that that brain tumors come from stem cells that are mute, mutated. And I, you know, and my rationale was that brain tumors in children, in particular, but also in adults, tend to occur right in the middle of the brain. And I knew separately from my stem cell research that that's where the stem cells are located. And so I had this idea, and I told everybody this and every person I told, including my PhD thesis committee at Caltech, which considered kicking me out uh, and not letting me continue uh, because they thought my out idea was so outlandish, uh, you know, told me, I'm crazy, this is a stupid idea, there's no way I can prove it. And so my PhD committee told me, look, if you want to keep your PhD he you know, program here, you have six months to show a proof of concept. And so I said, fine. And I went to the undergraduate you know, school to US UCLA and I found uh, a dozen undergraduate pre-medical students who were very eager and wanted to work hard and work for free uh, in exchange for a letter of recommendation and an authorship on a, on a paper. And I went to surrounding labs and I stole at night you know, all the different uh, reagents and equipment, everything I needed, and set up a makeshift lab over there. And, and uh, in four months, so not even in six, I, I got the proof of concept. And, and this ended up not only becoming a big a discovery in a big paper. It ended up, you know, being one of the initial discoveries that created a whole field of cancer stem cell biology that didn't exist prior to, to our work and, and some other work that happened by coincidence was happening at the same time in that field. So, um, and this has happened with, my, with one of my other companies with, with Levation. You know, everybody who I told this to, ophthalmologists, plastic surgeons, dermatologists, told me I'm crazy, this is stupid, it's too easy, it's never gonna work, somebody else would have done it already, but it turns out it's, it's possible, so, and we've shown it. Did they call and tell sorry for not believing in you? I'm sorry? Uh, did they call you and say that they are sorry that they were not believing in you? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your three key yeah, points? Two, two, two things uh, that I'll tell uh, folks in Armenia. Trust your instinct, network, and learn English. If you want to be global, English is the language of choice. Simple as that. Yeah, thank you. That's okay, I mean, I agree with the English, so <laughs> I think it's important. I don't know, I would say don't be disappointed. I mean, research is a high-risk thing. I mean, you do a lot of things, a lot of things doesn't work. Then you have to just keep doing it and not get disappointed. I mean, and that's a, a first thing I would say. Second, uh, hard work. I think it's, it's a hard work. I mean, you shouldn't underestimate going yeah. to, into research. I think it's really hard work and uh, I don't know. And, when you start doing that hard work, remember that day has only 24 hours. I mean, you cannot, don't overestimate what can be done. 
This is usually, at least when I started going in research, I was always overestimated. I was thinking, okay, because I have the concept, this is, this, these are the steps I can take and will do it. I was thinking I will do it, let's say, in a month. And then the deadline comes, passes, and goes another year, and you're still running. I mean, I think there's a tendency in research, actually. People yeah, overestimate their, their own abilities, how fast they will do, be able to do the things. Okay, so. thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a break, but uh, please be here at 
Uh, the, this session now, it's, it's, it's 5.30. Um, this, uh, this session is named Stem Cells, Genome Editing and Novel Bio Biological Therapies. Uh, and we will begin with Dr. Roger Hajar, who is a director of Cardiovascular Research Center and the Arthur and Janet C. Ross Professor of Medicine at the Econ School of Medicine in New York. Um, he is a world leader in the field of cardi cardiac gene therapy and genome editing uh, for heart failure, and it's a, a huge privilege to have him on stage. Uh, Dr. Hajar, take it over. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, it's a great uh, privilege to be back in uh, Yerevan and uh, to be able to uh, talk about some of the work on gene therapy and genome editing uh, in my specific field, which is uh, heart failure and cardiomyopathy. So, uh, sort of thinking of heart failure, uh, a very simple way or simplified way of thinking of about it is that you have an injury that causes a normal heart muscle to become abnormal and whether it's coronary disease, infarction, genetic uh, predisposition, chronic hypertension, pregnancy, that can induce damage to the myocardium and the single cells become damaged and you have a, a damaged heart that has Failing cardiac cells, cells are dying, extracellular matrix with fibrosis increasing, and all this basically leads to the uh, specific uh, symptoms and, and syndrome of uh, congestive heart failure. Now, each cardiac cell uh, has specific abnormalities in the failing heart, but at the very end of heart failure, you basically have the same type of phenotype in terms of what happens to the heart. Now we focus a lot on the cardiac cell itself because we're trying to do the repair inside the cardiac cell. And in cardiac cell uh, physiology, everything starts with excitation, contraction, coupling. So an action potential that depolarizes the membrane induces the entry of a small amount of calcium through the L-type calcium channel and this then induces the release of a much larger amount of calcium to the myofilaments. Then the calcium is activating the uh, cross bridges which produces force and uh, induces tension. Um, and then during relaxation, calcium is taken back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum through very important pumps called the SR calcium ATPase pump and through the sodium calcium exchanger. Now, my lab for many, many years has really focused on calcium cycling abnormalities uh, and the deficiency of this important protein called CIRCA to um, try to understand how different disease states such as heart failure uh, can uh, basically affect the calcium cycling. And we've devised specific therapies, whether it's uh, gene delivery of CIRCA or activation of the post-translational modifications of CIRCA uh, to basically enhance CIRCA function. And that's really been uh, the kind of crux of our work in the last uh, 20 years or so. Now, the deficiency in heart failure uh, of this calcium cycling abnormality induces an elevation of calcium inside the cell that leads to more and more progression of heart failure inducing hypertrophic response genes, uh, decreased cycling and ATP production, and overall heart failure uh, progression. And over the years, we've taken a number of approaches. Uh, one is to directly address the decrease in expression of this protein. Second is to modulate the post-translational mo modification 
namely through uh, circuit pump activity. And three is to look at the transcriptional regulation of circuit. So we're making advances on all these fronts, but the one that I'm gonna talk about for the gene therapy part is the decrease in expression because that really directly relates to the gene therapy work. So when you, do, when you have a gene therapy program, you basically have first to choose the vectors, you have to devise the modes of delivery, you have to address the immune response, and then you get to the clinical trials. Now these are the vectors used in the cardiovascular system uh, for now many, many years. Uh, it's uh, different types of vectors, different types of delivery. Uh, DNA plasmid, which is first shown here, is sort of the uh, uh, original way of directly inducing uh, gene expression. I'll come back to AEV because that's an important component. Lentiviruses have also been used. They uh, come up, they give you long-term expression. They're very inefficient in the heart. And of course, you can end up in front of a tumor suppressing area, which is always a problem. Now, the adenovirus is the uh, kind of the workhorse of gene therapy. It's a very uh, a promiscuous vector. It can infect every type of cell. Uh, the problem with it, it causes a severe immune response because a lot of viral genes are expressed and the expression pattern is very uh, short. Now, a new entry in the gene therapy armamentarium is modified mRNA. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about modified mRNA because uh, you can inject it directly, it gives you expression very, very fast, uh, lasts very short time though, but for certain applications, it's really ideal. Now, the field of gene therapy really uh, has changed since the advent of AV vectors. So adeno-associated vectors uh, are helper-dependent parvovirus they, are, they come with adenoviruses. They contain no viral gene. They're very small. You can see the difference between an adenovirus, I'm sorry, an adenovirus and an AV. They're single-stranded DNA that becomes double-stranded inside the nucleus, and they have a broad distribution to different organs. Now, one of the interesting things about AV vectors is that the different serotypes target different organs, so AV1, targets the muscles, six also, nine the heart, uh, AV8 the liver, and a lot of the macular degeneration work has been done with AV5, which targets the retina. So over the years, we've looked at different modes of delivery, so how do you deliver the vectors to uh, the heart? Uh, you can do an open heart bypass procedure where you have things under control, anti-grade, retrograde, you know, obviously very invasive. Uh, you can do a retrograde injection uh, through the coronary sinuses like you see here. And uh, you can do a direct injection into the myocardium. And one of the simplest ways that we've used clinically is to inject slowly down the coronary arteries without blocking any flow so that the patient doesn't have, especially a heart failure patient, doesn't have to uh, have any problems during that procedure. Now, what are the key factors for increasing transduction efficiency through uh, in the heart? Uh, things are kind of obvious. One is increasing coronary flow, uh, which we can do clinically. Increasing perfusion pressure, uh, we can do that, but the patient will definitely not like it. Uh, we give uh, we can increase dwell time, so that's why we can give long-term, uh, so have the dwell time to be high. We can increase the permeability agents, so we can give cyclic GMP uh, modulators, such as nitroglycerin, nitrates, uh, even uh, PD5 inhibitors. So all these things have been shown to enhance uptake. And in the, in the case of the clinic, we've injected all these vectors in patients with nitroglycerin in the background. So IVTNG, where you can turn it off very quickly if the blood pressure goes down, uh, has been ideal to, uh, in this situation. 
Now, uh, even though uh, the AV vectors are not immunogenic, uh, they can induce a T cell response if the vector concentration is very high. So if the CDA positive T cells recognize particles that are taken up by MAC class one cells, uh, you have a T cell response that can really wipe out uh, the vector. And that's something that we can track using LE, uh, LE spot assays uh, for the various capsids that we do. So uh, we've completed first in man clinical trials using circuit 2A with AV vectors. Uh, at that time, the FDA did not allow us to go very high in terms of the concentration. Uh, the procedure was quite simple. The patient would come in for a cardiac catheterization and then get injection down either the coronary arteries or the bypass graft, depending on what they have. In this first trial, uh, where we're looking at the number of clinical events, there was no difference between uh, circa delivery and uh, saline delivery. Uh, and this was our first, really, attempt uh, at doing gene therapy in, in a very sick patient population. And what we found was that in the human trials, uh, the uptake of vector was very small. So the concentrations was quite low, and then we had very few infected cardiac cells. Uh, these were in animal models where we were positive, where we had half to three quarters of the cells infected. Uh, however, in um, the clinical trials, it was very low. So all the new trials that we're uh, working on have concentrations that are about 100 times higher than what we had uh, with Cupid. Now, one of the issues with uh, neutralizing antibodies uh, uh, or with AV vector is that you can have neutralizing antibodies that are antecedent, so if a, per, a person has been exposed to AV vectors or any of its serotypes, they will have a neutralizing antibody response. So in Europe and uh, in the US, we had very high titers of antibodies in patients. So up to 60, 70% of patients had neutralizing antibodies and they had to be excluded from the trials. So what are we doing about that? Uh, one is, uh, since we heard about exosome, I added these few slides from Susmita Sahu's lab in our center. Uh, we isolate AV vectors using HEK293 cells, and there's a specific band right here uh, that has exosomes and AV inside of them. And we usually throw away the, this band because it's not pure AV. However, what we found is that if we take these, vector, these uh, AV exosomes, uh, this is a, a study looking at neutralizing antibody in vitro. So we have cardiac cells, and we're looking how much transduction there is in the presence of increasing amount of neutralizing antibody. So if you have no neutralizing antibody, you have a lot of cells being infected in red. But as you go up with neutralizing antibody, those cells... Uh, don't show up anymore or are not infected. Now, if you use AV exosomes, you actually completely uh, mitigate the neutralizing antibody response. So it's basically protecting the AV vectors from the neutralizing antibodies, as you can see here. In vivo, similar uh, actions happen. So you basically have mice that have uh, neutralizing antibody and you can see there's no uptake in the heart, liver with the AV vector. But once you use AV exosome, despite the fact that it's neutralizing antibody, uh, you can basically have uptake. So this is one method that we're thinking about and using in humans to basically be able to use AV vectors uh, to escape neutralizing antibodies. Now, what about other ways. So one way we're, we're, uh, we've worked on for many years is called directed evolution. It's a little bit more of a molecularly based uh, uh, way of changing the capsid of the vector. And what we do is we break down the DNA of the known AV serotypes here. We allow them to uh, form mosaics. The mosaics then are tested for the characteristics that we want. Do you want to escape neutralizing antibody? Do you want to make it more cardiotropic? 
Um, and this is one vector that we have, uh, AV2I8, which has mosaics, uh, mosaics from different serotypes. And this serotype actually uh, escapes neutralizing antibodies. So here are a dozen patients from our heart failure center. And all of them have some neutralizing antibody to AV2 or AV8. But you can see that they don't have neutralizing antibody to AV2I8. So we're able to make a vector now that can escape the neutralizing antibodies. And here's a trial that's starting imminently uh, with this vector, AV2I8, with another target called I1C. It's an inhibitor protein, which is upstream of circuit 2A and basically enhances the phosphorylation of phospholamban and induces circa activity. And we're hoping to inject the first patient in December. Now, we've been able to combine uh, our vector strategy, not just to enhance contractile function, but to, let's say, decrease fibrosis. So fibrosis plays an important role in cardiomyopathies, whether it's inherited or in congestive heart failure. And a few years ago, we identified a matricellular protein called CCN5 that seems to reverse established fibrosis, which is quite important. And by doing that, uh, you can basically take um, late-stage fibrotic uh, lesion and then induce uh, resorption of the fibrosis. Here's our vector with circa and CCN5, so you're enhancing contractility and reversing fibrosis. This is a sheep model of ischemia reperfusion. Uh, you can see here the left ventricle with a big infarct and a lot of mitral regurgitation in the sheep model. Now, one-time delivery of this uh, double vector basically improves the contractile function here and reduces mitral regurgitation significantly. Now, another disease state that we've been very interested in is pulmonary hypertension. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is a deadly disease uh, affecting a lot of young people. Um, and the etiology is basically shown here. This is a characteristic of pulmonary hypertension, this onion-shaped, smooth muscle cell within the, the uh, pulmonary arteriole. You have uh, obliteration of these small pulmonary arterioles and the right ventricle becomes very large. Now, we had previously shown that circuit 2A plays a role in smooth muscle cell proliferation. In, prolifer in pathological stimuli, smooth muscle cell proliferate, and you can basically induce circuit gene transfer to reverse that. So here's a pig model of pulmonary hypertension. Here's the right ventricle, normal heart, normal uh, left ventricle. In pulmonary hypertension, the right ventricle becomes very large and pushes the left ventricle to be small. And this is a one-time inhaled delivery of AV circa to, uh, in the pig model. And this is a long-term follow-up showing improved survival. And this is a clinical trial that the FDA is looking at right now uh, in terms of class one and class two pulmonary hypertension uh, with intratracheal delivery of AV1 circa in uh, patients with pulmonary hypertension. And we hope to start this trial sometime in the next, uh, later next year, uh, sometimes in Q4 of 2019. So I only have, unfortunately, a few minutes for uh, the genome editing talk. Uh, but some of the mutations that we've been interested in, in terms of uh, cardiomyopathies, include uh, one mutation called the phospholamban R14 deletion. And phospholamban inhibits circuit 2A uh, and in its unphosphorylated form, and these mutations are associated with cardiomyopathies. One such cardiomyopathy is uh, one that's been uh, known in uh, the Netherlands. It was first identified in a Greek family, but in a Groningen region in the Netherlands, there are um, thousands of families that have this mutation. And you basically get this very arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy uh, where you have ventricular arrhythmias. So initially, uh, we worked on getting blood from these patients and uh, inducing cardiomyocytes. Uh, and we're able to show 
that using genome editing with talons and CRISPR, you can correct a mutation, and we use a gene therapy approach to do that. We also created mice uh, that mimic the human form of phospholamban. And I'll cut short basically showing that you can uh, have these arrhythmogenic phenotype in the mice. Uh, here's a normal, uh, here's a normal mouse, I'm oh, sorry, this is a phospholamban mouse where fast pacing induced ventricular arrhythmias. And with a phospholamban R14 mutation, you basically have a lower threshold for this uh, stimulation. So we used AV with CRISPR to basically cut uh, the mutation or using our guide RNA to basically home in the CRISPR to the mutation. And uh, what we found was that we're able to get 23% correction. So 23% of the cardiac cells corrected uh, with this strategy. This is about uh, what we find. And by doing so, we're able to correct the mutation, the phenotype. So here's uh, the frequency at which you can induce VT in these R14 mice, very low, so very pathogenic. You can correct that using AV CRISPR. So uh, gene therapy has been found to be safe in cardiovascular applications. There's more and more AV vector uh, work that's being done in the heart, especially in uh, cardiomyopathies and heart failures. Re-engineered vex vectors will increase applications in many cardiovascular disease. Postnatal genome editing is a promising new strategy, and uh, many laboratories are taking advantage of this. Um, and hopefully, with a better selection of patients, we'll get uh, uh, positive results in the uh, near future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Hajar, for an exciting talk. Uh, would you, we have time for questions? Uh, uh, yeah, over there. Sorry. I thought it was a panel discussion. In your evolved variants, you have identified capsids that evade the immune response. Do you anticipate that these will simply delay the uh, arising of, of resistance? And do the mutations affect other capsid functions like uptake or uncoding? Yeah, no, that's, those are all uh, very good questions. So what we're trying to escape is the, the antecedent neutralizing antibody. So uh, can you hear me? OK. So. What we're trying to escape is the antecedent neutralizing antibody. So once the vector, whether it's re-engineered or not, is delivered, you will get a B cell response. So you're going to have neutralizing antibodies going forward. So that's not going to be delayed. So you can't reapply uh, the same vector. Now your questions about whether these re-engineered vectors have problems coming in and so on. So we select them for cardiac tropism for escaping neutralizing antibodies. But there, there's a caveat to all that is that they're very hard to make. And especially now that we use very high concentrations, it's becoming very painful to make these vectors because you, know, you can mess around with nature, but something has to give. And what gives usually is the fact that making them at very high concentration is a problem. One more question. Uh, I was very impressed with that part of your talk when you were talking about the transdifferentiation of the fibroblast into the working cardiomyocytes. Uh, do you think these techniques are applicable for, uh, for pulmonary fibrosis that is still is an incurable disease and people are just dying of suffocation? Because I have a friend who died from it. Just, <laughs> there's no way to stop it. Yeah. So. Our work in pulmonary hypertension has also application in pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, you're very correct, pulmonary fibrosis is a really very, very deadly disease. So we're using gene therapy strategies for pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and so far what I'm seeing, it seems to work. Uh, so we'll see whether it can make the 
step towards clinical trials, but it's definitely a very, very deadly disease in young patients, even worse than pulmonary hypertension. Thank you very much, Dr. Hajar. Uh, we continue with, the, uh, with Dr. Nikolai Dokolan, who is uh, Vice Chair of Pharmacology and Director of the Center of Integrated Biology uh, at Penn State University Hershey Medical Center. His talk uh, is named uh, From Etiology to Therapeutics of Lou Gehrig's Disease. Okay. Well, I switched the talk. So I realized that the conference is about engineering evolution, and we do protein engineering, and so for therapy and for research. So that's why that's, that's going to be the title of my talk instead. Um, and we'll postpone TLS hopefully to, till next time. <clears throat> and um, my lab is really interested in uh, pursuing big applications, to, uh, challenging problems in medicine. Some of them, uh, uh, ALS is one of them, and that was uh, my title of my previous talk that I was planning to do. But, um, but there are others. And we design tools to address those issues, and, uh, to, the, to target those problems. And, um, oh. okay. anyway, uh, so we, uh, we, and I'll describe the tools that we develop, and we'll, I'll describe a couple of applications of these tools. And some of them is a new hot story that is currently under review in uh, one of the good, good journals. And the other one is how we, it's already published, but it's really fun story, how we can control cells with light or drugs and make them dance and do whatever we want with them. So uh, let's start with the tools. Uh, first is simulations. Uh, we needed something that is fast, not the traditional approaches that were too slow, but we needed to, to sample conformations of proteins at much, much faster rate. And what we had to do is to go to the roots of simulations and uh, come up with a completely new design for doing molecular dynamic simulation. So instead of doing traditional uh, integration of equations of motions called Newtonian equations of motions, we decided to do um, uh, search by looking at collision events. So physics is the same, but the thinking is totally different. And it took us 12 years to develop this because at that time we were basically by ourselves. Um, and, but the reward was amazing because we were able to fold uh, proteins that you see here uh, currently, uh, they are not folded by any computer uh, in the world. Actually, uh, Ubiquitin was folded recently by Anton. It's, the, uh, it's a specialized hardware architecture that, uh, that uh, Disha used to build, uh, spent $500 million to build that thing. And, but 126 residue villain headpiece, nobody has folded. Uh, not only that, we can fold them so many small proteins so many times that we can actually compute the folding rates. And you can see, uh, you can get it to almost uh, NMR uh, level resolution. For protein design, we, de we develop tools to predict the impact of mutation on stability of protein structure. And that uh, actually tools were quite accurate that we, uh, and the reason for that is because we were able to incorporate flexibility in design of uh, molecules. Um, the tool has actually got so popular that uh, we build a website uh, and you will see a bunch of websites that servers that you can use in order if you want to try your protein. If you do a mutagenesis, it's a very quick and easy way to check how the mutation affects the protein. Why do we care about mutations? If you do protein design, you substitute one amino acid by another, right? You try to find the most optimal sequence that will result in a given structure. So this is, was a critical part. However, when you do design, you are guided, as a physicist, you are guided by one parameter, which is energy. Unfortunately, this one parameter is one out of many, many dimensional uh, space where protein lives, and you need really other parameters to tell that what you design looks and feels like real protein. So we design a whole uh, quality control pipeline if you design a protein or build a protein out of scratch to check whether it has problems. And there is a list of problems, and the uh, software that does this is called Chiron. One of the critical problems that uh, typically appear in building proteins or designing proteins is clashes between atoms. And if you take a look at a uh, typical situation, there are so many clashes 
that uh, this, uh, this picture yellow uh, indicates a clash. And you can see this is a modeled protein. And you see how many problems in this protein uh, you can already find. So with this software, you can actually, uh, called Chiron, you can resolve those clashes in a very fast manner. And there is a whole anecdotal story. Uh, maybe I can answer, I can tell you later uh, how this whole uh, approach and methodology was discovered. <clears throat> One of the, uh, I would say, gold mine in drug discovery is figuring out how to discover drug com drugs computationally. Unfortunately, the computational drug discovery has been extremely patchy because it's very hard to account uh, conformations of the small molecule as well as proteins upon docking of small molecule to a protein. So because both of them undergo conformational change. This phenomenon is called induced fit, has been known to biologists for a long time, but it's very hard to account for. So we, I don't have time to explain how we figure out how to deal with this, but we did. And we were able to actually do dynamically uh, simulate uh, induced fit and actually predict positioning of a drug quite precisely. The purple one is simulations, and the gray one is uh, the drug is the crystal structure. And you see they're perfectly overlapping. This, of course, happens not always, but very often. Uh, and of course, this is our poster child. But what's interesting, if you look at the binding energy, second plot versus RMSD, how far away your prediction is from actual structure, you see the funnel-like shape, which means the lowest, the best prediction corresponds to the best energy. So you can actually predict what would be the best position. And with that, we actually done a lot of screening. And this is actually the third picture is the result of the actual screening. You see we're positioning different drugs. And check out how the, uh, that drug influences the structure of the pocket. You cannot do rigid docking. And that's why this approach is basically a solution to avoid rigid docking and do drug discovery. Uh, we have now built a website to do this one by one. Unfortunately, the software to do it in bulk is not yet available, but ho hopefully soon it will. One of the cool uh, thing that we have been pursuing, uh, because it's um, important for design, it's sub molecular substructure search. Sounds abstract, right? But the idea here is, let's say you have a prominent feature of the protein, and you want to use it somewhere. Or you want to find some other proteins. For example, you know your antibody binds to this target. And you want to find all other proteins that this antibody will recognize, talking about various uh, antibody therapeutics. So we have actually developed a method uh, for uh, molecular substructure search. And so maybe the, just one second. Yeah, it got disconnected. <laughs> it's all there. Perfect. Thank you so much. So for molecular substructure search, and the idea here is that uh, you basically take any sort of slice of molecular structure, it's uh, orange or uh, yellow, and for example, if you want to design an enzyme or transplant the enzyme, so think about transplantation at molecular level, at atomic level. That's what we want to do. Then you want to find all other proteins that will host this, or we can utilize it. For example, we can want to transfer one metal site from one protein to another. And so for this, so there are so many applications for this, such as molecular engineering, drug discovery, functional annotation, finding new drug targets. And, uh, and the approach is to build basically a graph theoretical approach to cure uh, the uh, interatomic distances, based on interatomic distances, uh, uh, the whole structures uh, that are available to us in, in uh, uh, right now to, to us. And the, but the principal difficulty is that subgraph mining is an incomplete problem, which means it's very, very hard. Uh, nevertheless, David Shervanians has found a solution. And uh, as, a Q, as, a, as a test, we just took a molecule, uh, an input site, a number, a few residues around um, a protein that holds tetracycline. And based on that, we found 13 other 
proteins that would bind tetracycline. Ten of them have been validated already. So that's really cool. So if you want to look for side effects of drugs, you can just use this approach. It's very easy. Uh, so, and it's available online. Erebus, it's called Erebus. David Shervanians is Armenian, so he decided to name the service Erebus. Um, one of the big aspects of the lab is designing allosteri. What is allosteri? Allosteri, there are different types of allosteri. There is allosteri that is a ligand binding, a lig uh, a displacement of the uh, protein protein or protein ligand interactions, ligand uh, driven binding of other ligands or proteins, and all of this happens at a distance. But what we're going to uh, utilize is ligand driven dynamic coupling, which means that when we bind a ligand, uh, the rightmost uh, low plot, uh, yellow piece, it will uh, not change the structure much, but it will uh, allow us to detect fluctuations, uh, change the fluctuations at the active site. Why it's important is because if we want to control proteins, you want to figure out how to change the, the fluctuations of the active sites so to make it in, uh, inactive. Right? So you can go from active to inactive state by controlling allosteric site in this case. The algorithm to, that, uh, that does that uh, was uh, to find allosteric sites, and we actually do it quite now uh, uh, routinely, was developed by former student and now professor at Penn State who is sitting on the second row here, Elizabeth Proctor. And the idea here is to sample micro, mi mi microsecond time scale simulations. That's why we use DMD. And then perform covariation analysis, build graphs, graphs, weighted graphs, prune those graphs, and then find connections. That was passed. Turns out you can actually deduct all of this information from pure structure. Unfortunately, this story is not published and the website is not live yet. It's going to be called om.dokhlab.org. Uh, so if you, uh, very soon, uh, hopefully as soon as we publish, it's going to go live. But we can detect, uh, detect very robustly and we validate it on many, many proteins, uh, allosteric paths and proteins. And not only that, we can redesign them. We can alter them. We can change the allosteri and connections within the protein. This is really cool. This is a totally new era. Um, one more tool that uh, I'll describe, it's uh, just published uh, basically two weeks ago or a week ago. And the idea is you have a functional protein, right? And you want to control it. One way to control it is to split it in half so that it will not reassemble. But you will uh, allow it to reassemble only if you functionalize with some groups that would interact with each other. It can be groups that are, for example, protein A and protein B, and you can detect in li life whether this A and B interact. That's one application, right? So you can probe protein-protein interactions in living cells. If you take this protein that you split as a GFP, for example, simple application. So uh, this methodology is available, and it's called SPELL uh, from uh, yeah, so I'm going to split how we do it. Um, but I'll just uh, mention that uh, the way how we functionalize now this uh, splitting is we, uh, we add one of the, uh, to one of the halves a protein domain called F protein called FRB and to the other one FKBP. Those two proteins dimerize when you add rapamycin. So basically, by adding rapamycin, you control the assembly of a split protein. So you have rever a reversal here. Um, and I'm just going to mention that we have applied this methodology for WAV, one of the cancer targets. And it works really nicely. So you add rapamycin, and you see uh, 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 increased morphodynamics at the leading edge of the cells. This uh, protein, WAV2, is responsible for metastasis, one of the key proteins in metastasis. All right, this is our methodologies. Let me get you to, uh, get you to a more exciting parts to our stories. And I selected two stories uh, here. One of them is unpublished, but it's currently on the second revision, one of the Nature Journals. It's really fun. We spent, we got a grant from NIH. We haven't published a single paper on that grant. They were extremely patient. And finally, this is six years of our lives. Uh, it's a HIV vaccine story. So uh, HIV, as you know, is a big problem. Uh, there are no currently uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. 
and uh, and what is more important, there are no really uh, real vaccines. The problem for that is that uh, HIV virus is highly mutagenic. However, there are some, and so it's very hard for antibodies to grab to any, any particular place. However, you, because the structure is conserved, there must be some regions that are conserved in evolution. And those regions are conserved, in fact. So there are regions of conserved residues on HIV virus, GP120 uh, viral code protein. However, they are covered with sugars. So nature is super smart. So it puts a lot of sugars around it. So this is this how they look like at the bottom. Uh, so there is no, again, for antibodies to come and grab. So it turns out my collaborator, Ron Swanstrom, discovered by actually going to Africa and collecting HIV samples and studying patients that actually it's, very, it's, it's a high pr evolutionary pressure to maintain all the sugars intact. So typically, each viral strain loses one or two sugars. That creates an opportunity for us because we get a glycan hole that we, we can feel. The question is, how do you trigger our, our immune system to recognize those holes? Puzzle, huh? So what, that's why we do molecular uh, 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 design. So we cut. Uh, the idea is to identify this uh, carbohydrate, uh, carbohydrate occluded neutralizing epitopes and uh, uh, raise antibodies and uh, put them on some benign proteins. And so here's the uh, workflow. Uh, put it in some benign proteins, do structural characterization, stabilize them, and then inject it into rabbits, raise antibodies, and sh see whether they can neutralize the virus. Well, so for each uh, cone, and they are at the top here, and you see they can be non-contiguous regions, so it can be beta sheet, so with multiple beta strands, which are not connected, we find ma multiple support scaffolds, and it's important to have multiple support scaffolds because if you raise antibodies, you want to be sure that they are specific and bind specifically to your epitope and nothing else. So we only select antibodies that will bind to multiple scaffolds simultaneously, which means they bind to our epitopes. So we've done it for all of them. We made sure that they're stable, we redesigned them. Uh, then we made them in the laboratory and checked that they're stable, have the same secondary structure, solve crystal structure for some of them, to 2 and 1.2 angstrom resolution. Uh, and turns out our design was not that bad. So one of the scaffolds came up with 0.42 angstrom precision, or the other one is 0.34 angstrom precision. So that's how uh, precise you can design sometimes uh, uh, right now using computers. Um, and then we uh, immunized the rabbits, collected antibodies, made sure that they actually, uh, and used various adjuvants to make sure that immune system responds. And then we actually tested it and showed that there is, in fact, neutralization. Unfortunately, I don't have a pointer to the point where it is, but uh, a couple of rabbits show uh, neutralization, and the antibody itself uh, recognizes the epitope at million-fold dilution. So it's a very, very good uh, set of antibodies. I will just spend one minute to mention, because my computer died, so I can actually uh, take maybe extra minute. How do we control cells? It's a second story. And the idea here is to take any kinase and, first of all, you make a, um, and create a constitutively active kinase so that you can activate or inactivate it on a whim. Then you insert a handle into kinase domain called KD that would respond either to light or drug. If you add a drug, it will, through allosteric, it will activate kinase domain. So you'll have a star in the kinase domain. Otherwise, it's kinase dead. The kinase domain is dead. Or you use light, and through allosteric-osteric uh, interactions, you can also do the same. So you can use light or drug, and there is benefits to both. Light is great for cellular studies. Drugs are great for animals. You don't want to drill a hole in the skull in order to activate a protein. So you can add a drug, and the animal responds. So uh, initially, we used rapamycin that dimerizes uh, FRB and FKBP. The idea is right here. So the red one is the active site. The insertion is the purple. When you add rapamycin, it recruits FRB. And the dynamics of the red loop becomes smaller. And as a result, the kinase becomes active. Inactive, add you, uh, you add drug, and it's uh, uh, active. 
So that looks like a futuristic computer simulations that have nothing to do re with reality. I didn't believe it myself until I saw those movies. So this is cell, and then you add, uh, add uh, rapamycin, and you see dorsal protrusions sticking out of cells. And this is uh, uh, our focal adhesion kinase under control. In fact, we made so many of them. We, it's fully transferable methodology to various types of kinases. You can actually now make cells to follow you with laser light and dance for you. So it's really a lot of fun that you can implement this. But this methodology is too complicated because you have to functionalize with one protein and then add another protein and add a drug. So it's too complex. Biologists don't like that. So we decided to completely rewire the story, to connect these two halves and uh, create a completely new protein that doesn't exist in nature. It's unstable by itself and only is stable when you add a drug. And this is how this uh, protein looks like. Moreover, this story is a story of a, it's a, it's a very funny story because it's a rotation project of a student who is now at Harvard, but he, he was a student in my lab at that time. And I didn't believe it would work. So he had one shot to make the protein that he designed. And he did. And so the idea would be is you insert this uni wrapper, we call it uni wrapper, uh, into target domain through allosteric and regulate activity of a protein. So in simulations, it did work because you see the specific heat shifts from uh, left to right when you add rapamycin, which means that protein stabilizes when you add rapamycin. Moreover, the distance between two halves of the protein significantly reduces from all over the place red line to peaked around the green line, the black, uh, black curve. I see. So we put it in, in a protein called SARC. And by chemical assays, you see the red square shows that without rapamycin, the, the kinase is dead. You add rapamycin, is, it's active. What's nice is that you, uh, you can see the typical effect of SARC activation is the cell swells. It increases in size. But Anur discovered something completely new that was not known about SARC phenotype. It actually, some types of some cells exhibit polarized spreading. And that's what you would expect in metastasis. It's polarized spreading. We don't know yet why some cells do this while others don't, but that was really an interesting discovery. We put it in zebrafish, so it's actually transferable methodology to animals. You, then you add basically rapamycin to aquarium and uh, you, you, you follow uh, the same protocol. We went further and did the same with light. We, it was recently published in Science. And then we also put this thing in the multiplex control. So the idea is that controlling one protein tells you just one piece of information on a whole milieu of things. And that's like, again, I like this analogy when you look at the screen and try to understand the picture by looking at one pixel. So our goal in the lab is to look at the whole picture. So we start putting more proteins under control and deciphering the phenotype. So you can put one protein on, uh, uh, in the network under positive control, WAV, and the other one under negative control, RAC. Turns out that creates a totally new phenotype. Oops, I don't have a slide for that. But it creates a new phenotype where uh, you have very stable uh, protrusions and uh, very uh, smooth protrusions uh, happen in uh, cellular structure. All right, I'm done here. Thank you for your listening. So the work was... <laughs> I just want to mention that, that, that this work would not be... I'm just the PR person. This work was done by a lot of people in my lab and outside of my lab, and uh, it, I couldn't have been without my team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Helan, for a fascinating talk. Uh, we have a question over there. Can I ask two questions? Maybe. Um, so, so thank you for a wonderful talk. So uh, did I get it right when, when I was looking at the structures of the scaffolds with the epitopes on them? Did you take basically helical epitopes and put them into helical bundles, or at least in those examples? Or did you tr basically try to match the secondary structure or something like that? The way how we did it, we basically looked at all structures that would exhibit, so using Erebus. Yeah, OK. Basically, using substructure match, yeah. we found yeah. all structures that would exhibit almost identical substructures. And that's what we, and we had criteria that is going to be small yeah. and easily customizable if we want to increase the stability. Got it. So we had multiple of them, yeah. Okay. And my other question was that I always thought that your DMD, the digital 
I mean, this Creed MD it was very, very clever, and I'm, I'm glad to see that it basically used a lot in your lab. But did you? And I haven't kept up with the literature. And I don't know if you've published on this, but. Is, it, is there a way to tell sort of like what the, what the, what the impact of digitization is and like how much can you digitize past which you will, you will not get sensible results? Like can you get sort of estimates on that? If you get, sorry? Um, do, you, do you know what impact the discretization oh. has on, on the accuracy or quality? You know, is there some way to predict that? Well, so these designs, they were made with uh, DMD software and with others. So you see. The, you see the precision that you get is 0 0.3 angstrom. No, I mean like in design. theory, like theoretically. Yeah, in simulations, it's mm -hmm. very similar. The trick is um, you uh, remove water. Mm -hmm. We remove water. Because we don't have water and use it uh, if implicitly, we have to uh, change the degrees of freedom. And that's what actually increases the speed of simulations on the top of the algorithmic development. Mm -hmm. So. The force field is actually not that different from charm. It's just, it's in fact, it has additional terms that, would, that come from quantum mechanics, which would include four body interactions responsible for hydrogen bonding. But what about the discretization, right? I mean, what's the Oh, you can of that? take any continuous potential and right. make many, many, many steps, as many as you want. You can actually make it look like completely continuous potential. It's just you don't have to. But, but that's what I'm saying. Like you're not doing that. So, what yeah. is the cost of discretization and accuracy? Do you, is there a way to? We found the sweet that? spot. So okay. you don't. We take Leonard Jones potential, electrostatic potential, and discretize it. I don't remember number of steps, but it's not that big, and okay. that require and that's that corresponds to 50 p, uh, femtosecond time step, basically in traditional. I see. I see. Okay. Uh, we have a question over there. Nikolai, in the last systems, on these allosteric systems, do you need to know, do you need to have structural information on the on and off state? And what's the magnitude of the binding difference that you need to get an effective signal? So uh, for uh, kinases, you don't need much uh, of an effect to kill them. Uh, but. Uh, and so for, and we always sort of, any allosteric inser insertion, we try, to, we, we find many allosteric pathways to the outside of, of the protein, and everything works. We haven't failed with kinases. Uh, but with, for example, GEFs, and we transfer this methodology to GEFs, GTPases, we want to put it in motors to make them work. Uh, but in GEFs, it's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit harder, because they are big, and their mode of action is actually, it's, it's the interaction with the factors. So we are talking about creating a huge shift in protein-protein interactions. But it's possible to do if you find the right coupling spot. So there we have success rate. We usually select three and two of them would work. One of them would be absolutely stellar, but like the other one, maybe so-so. Uh, can I also ask a quick question? Um, do you, do you envision any uh, shift from uh, current way of antibody design with phage displays or other t display technologies to something like this that's completely simulated on a computer and then into? Protein design field has evolved. Uh, there are so many cool approaches nowadays that uh, <laughs> there, is, there, is, uh, uh, there are many computational approaches. Uh, and you have presented already. and. You have you presented tomorrow. Yeah, so you will hear another protein design talk. Uh, but besides computational, I think the, the, what's leading everything is, um, is evolutionary approaches, like Don Hilbert was describing. And there you can actually take whatever computation has come, with, come up with and drive it to extremes, to real extremes. And that's, I think you can merge these technologies together. And that's what Don has been doing is to coupling these uh, technologies and making something that is extremely useful. Thank you very much, Dr. Lehmann, once again. <laughs> our, our next talk is by Dr. Naira Ivazan, who is a, a biophysicist at, and director at Orbelli Institute of Physiology of National Academy of Science of Republic of Armenia. And her talk is on regenerative medicine, present and future perspectives for Armenia. Well, uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, everybody, for waiting to, until this very last talk. Uh, 
first of all, before of my talk, I would like to provide my sincere gratitude to the organizers of this remarkable meeting, uh, to giving opportunity to present here our uh, well, achievements in Armenia concerning the tissue engineering. So we will talk about the regenerative medicine, the present and future perspectives, which we are trying to do in our uh, institute. And I'm representing the Orbeli Institute of Physiology of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, and when we talk about the regenerative medicine, the broadly defined, uh, it is uh, postulated as a branch of translational research in tissue engineering and molecular biology, which uh, deals with the process of replacing, engineering, and regenerating human cells, tissues, or organs to restore or establish normal function. Of course, currently we also uh, have the genetic engineering as a regenerative medicine, but after this very famous picture in New York Times in 1999, this topic became uh, quite contradictory, so the discussion is still firing. Uh, we will not talk about this, we will focus on tissue engineering. So from the engineering point of view, we uh, could simplify the problem uh, to this very, very uh, uh, primitive scheme that for tissue engineering we uh, should have cells, we should have some exoskeleton, uh, the habitat of these uh, cells, and we also have had to guarantee and to make all conditions for these cells to live and have the normal functioning. So uh, when we come to the biological level of engineering, uh, we should um, talk about these components of tissue engineering. Uh, it's already known that a variety of pluripotent stem cells could be the source of cells, whether it be embryonic or mesenchymal stem cells, and the scaffolds are now mimicking the uh, intracellular matrix, and with all these bioactive molecules in the solution, we will uh, guarantee the normal function of uh, tissue if we would like to have a engineered tissues. Uh, as a cell source, uh, it primarily was uh, more concerning the embryonic pluripotent stem cells. But now it's more and more attractive and especially also for us became the mesenchymal stem cells because the uh, source of these cells is that uh, could be tissue which is, uh, well, everyone ready to get rid easily from our organism because this is a fat. And uh, this is amazing how the, uh, due to this tissue engineering, the isolated fat tissue could become this very wonderful uh, beating cardiomyocytes on the Petri dish. So they have a contraction and this is some kind of a model of heart. Uh, so what makes the biomaterials, uh, what we should uh, have, what kind of criteria to design uh, biomaterials for tissue engineering? Uh, first of all, of course, it should be uh, appropriate mechanical and physical properties. It should proper degradation rate. Uh, what is very important, it shouldn't be production of some toxic agents during the degradation. Uh, of, uh, of cells, also we should promote cell adhesion and integration into surrounding tissue and minimum inflammatory and immune response. Uh, now what about the scaffolds which should make this uh, the exoskeleton of, for these cells? In a contemporary level of material science there are a uh, a big variety of different scaffolds, that artificial scaffolds that could be used to make the scaffold for uh, biomimetics, uh, which could be made for uh, in introduct the cells and for the, uh, made the scaffold for habitat of them. But uh, again, we shouldn't, I think, reinvent the wheel because the nature is uh, already cared about it, uh, so we could use the nat natural scaffolds. Uh, in 2008, when Doris Taylor lab presented the 
the cellularized rat heart and then the cellularized human heart, it uh, became clear that this technology could be very, very attractive in the very near observable future because at this case, when you have this, uh, the technology is very simply, uh, because uh, you washing out with detergents all cells from the natural organ, whether it be from animal or human, and you have the cellularized this very beautiful crystal heart or liver or uh, uh, any other organ, and uh, with this kind of scaffold, you could avoid many problems, which is uh, very actual for artificial scaffold, because there is uh, no problem with vascularization, which is very important, and also it has already the 3D structure, which is also could be a big problem for <coughs> scaffolds. So that was... Uh, that's where we are now. But of course, when we talk about the tissue engineering for people who are not biologists and outside of biology and medicine, it is not immediately clear why in the age of advancing computer and space technology, uh, we can't simply create a device that will replace function of a particular tissue. Uh, so let's take a closer look. Actually, when we talk about the biological engineering, the tissue engineering, we are working with the very unique uh, biological products which have the ability to grow and to self-organizing, which is uh, very important. And also the complicated uh, structure and complicated systemic condition of the tissue is uh, making nearly impossible to replace all these uh, biological tissues with an artificial organ. At least there are four reasons which is uh, very important. It's optimal design, it's uh, three so-called R cells, renewable, repairable and rechargeable, uh, multiple functions, some of them still hidden so it's not uh, clear what we will have in artificial organ and uh, operate within wide dynamic range with feedback control from other organs. So it's everything working in complex. So when we talk about the artificial organ, uh, we see tissue engineering. For me, tissue engineering is much more attractive. Uh, now, uh, let's just a couple of words about the current situation of tissue engineering in Armenia, because I'm representing the science in Armenia. Uh, we have only a few uh, organizations who are now uh, involved in the tissue engineering efforts. Uh, the, first of all, it's the Armenian Bone Marrow Donor Registry, which already operated many years very successfully, but they mainly uh, talk about the bone marrow donor registry to be able to replace the, some blood diseases like leukemia and so on. And uh, except of that, we have two very, very fresh new organizations, uh, which you can see here. Uh, they are uh, operating only maybe a couple of years, and they mainly focus on the 3D printing and uh, thinking about uh, these artificial biomimetics as a scaffolds, and they actually yet not have inks to make this printing. Now, uh, what is the source of our proud, then when you're Googling the tissue engineering in Armenia, the first few choices is concerning our institute, and mainly concerning this uh, hands-on course on tissue engineering, which was done in our institute at the end of last year. Uh, and it was directed with Professor Narine Sarvazian from George Washington University with a great success in the frame of Fulbright program. Uh, and uh, we talked about, uh, during the previous session, a lot about the investment, the financial investment, but uh, I have the idea that maybe in some cases the financial is investment is not the only which is necessary for the success and beneficiary uh, efforts for the Institute. Sometimes the personal and scientific expertise is also could be the very good uh, scientific invest, uh, investment in the 
uh, problem. So we've been quite lucky because we have Narina Sarvazan is our uh, many years collaborator al already and she's very dedicated to continue this kind of hands-on courses in our place. And moreover, we are very, very lucky to have uh, Professor Zaruhi Karabekyan, who is here, she's leading the laboratory of tissue engineering in our institute. And she also was the part of this uh, initiative concerning this Fulbright program. Uh, as you see, maybe, maybe you think that we have some gender <laughs> imbalance. So that's why I should mention also Hovane Saris Takesan, because he's also a very bright young um, young PhD who's now in George Washington University uh, also with the Fulbright program and he will became uh, more uh, more skilled uh, to return and also to assist for the next tissue engineering uh, course and concerning this course uh, I should just uh, explain maybe a little bit how it was done uh, Unfortunately, the space in our uh, experimental labs is not so big, so it, it was launched out the election for uh, the, the students with different backgrounds, different uh, stages of their education, and only 12 of them was elected by Professor Sarvazian during discussions and some uh, uh, well, talks to be able to work in the lab by hands because this was a practical course and the idea was within three and a half months to be able to uh, to make some different types of tissues. Uh, so they've been divided in four groups, uh, these 12 students, and at the end of this course, which as I've already mentioned was only three and a half months, they've been able to present their practical results uh, before of our scientific community and also the, Her Excellency, the ex-ambassador of U.S. Uh, was uh, also in our labs to see how goes this Fulbright project because this initiative war, was uh, the first practical course in Armenia within uh, Fulbright programs. So now uh, Professor Sarvazan together with uh, Professor Karabekyan are uh, making the bilingual manual for the uh, longer course, eight months uh, course of tissue engineering. It will be launched out next summer. And we uh, strongly believe that in this uh, case we will be able to choose some more uh, students to work in lab because we also have more opportunities. Uh, we also think about the possibilities to adapting tissue engineering course for high school level. It is also under the patronage of uh, Zari Karabekyan because she's also the curator of uh, biological courses in IBE school. And we've done a Tempus project concerning this uh, instance learning and one of the piloting projects was this TE you know, course for high schools and up, upper level. So we see our future, we really believe that for Armenia this is a very reachable uh, near future to become the very, very successful in TG engineering, maybe in a few years. Of course, I've, as we've mentioned during the last uh, again session, it's a big gap between science and uh, healthcare, so it's a problem to, Im to be able to translate immediately these research res results to the clinics. But uh, we will also try to somehow push it to be able to do it not in 10 years, but maybe, uh, maybe faster. Uh, but there is another also perspective which, uh, which uh, seems to us very, very interesting and in perspective for the research level. It is a so-called very new, absolutely uh, new technology of so-called human-on-chip, which uh, the, bright, uh, the brilliant idea to make a small parts of different tissues to connect them as it is connected in the human organism and to have this very uh, modern express test to be able to see how the drug, uh, to test drugs on all organisms or to modeling the some different pathologies of organism. It uh, seems like the 
rather sci-fi, but as you see, it's a real pro program, and uh, it, uh, it expected to become such kind of uh, complicated chip uh, for 2024, and already you could find some uh, Germany suppliers who are able to uh, to make these small chips for smaller, a few organs, maybe not for all human organs, but for two organs, for four organs, and we're also very interested and in to see our future, uh, future of our lab also in this direction, and we are trying to make a huge grant project in frame of Horizon 2020 European system to somehow provide also this part of investigations. So, um, I don't want to use your uh, patient more. Thank you for your attention. This is Thank you very much, Dr. Some Arvizan. questions, Thanks if a lot. you have uh, any. Yeah, any questions from the audience? Uh, thank you very much for very interesting and very promising uh, things you are doing here. I believe that these tissue engineering parts you described uh, in the very little, I will be happy to hear about, more about that. Mm -hmm. But it's some cutting edge technology which all world is doing now, so congratulations with that. Mm -hmm. Are you doing something with 3D printing? Because this is one of pro uh, uh, most uh, advantage uh, parts of uh, things. So it will be very useful if you will connect that to that. And also, are you have any, do you have any connection between medical university here, Mahitar Girazi or others? Because I believe that it will be very mm -hmm. important to bring some students from there who are uh, going to do some practical medicine. They can learn these things. And thank you. Absolutely, yes. Uh, uh, in this course also was students from medical university, of course, and they are the, I think, main target of these courses. But. Uh, we are, invest, uh, we are trying to collaborate with them, and our lab is uh, open also for any initiative from their part, but recently they decided that their main uh, well, topic of investigation should be brain research and neurophysiology, uh, which is very good, and it also could be done with uh, this uh, topic, but I, saw, uh, I think it's a bit more narrowing their interests from the whole uh, field. But uh, the main problem is that our clinical uh, part is absolutely closed for collaboration with uh, research. This is a, d a real problem here. How about 3D printing? What? Tissue printing, 3D printing of tissue. Uh, yes, well, there are, uh, maybe Zaruhi is here, she also could add that it is some types of 3D printers in here, and they are trying to make it with artificial uh, artificial biomimetics of the um, bioscaffolds, but still not very successful. It is very new, and they have not really the ink to print it. They are trying different types. Yeah, it's just starting. It's, nobody is so successful that they can already replace things with 3D printing. Mm -hmm. It is very perspective in my understanding. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, okay. okay. Let's us all thank Dr. Ivazan once again. Thank you. And this session is over now. Yeah, uh, the, this session is over now. Uh, we will meet each other again tomorrow. And ethnic di dinner will be starting at 7, and the buses are waiting at 6.45 outside uh, beside the fountain. Thank you. <laughs>